So first call to order, public comment. Looks like we have a crowd, which is good. We like to see people. Um, so again, public comment is a way to uh, provide the public the opportunity to give comment to the board. We do not respond in real time, but it's a very important part of our listening process. Um, I think probably a lot of you are here. Talk louder. Okay. Um, I might want to turn the fan off because if you can't hear me, you probably can't hear anyone else. Yeah. Uh, are we going to have like rotten food for us? No, the food's in the kitchen. Scooch closer, you can as well. Um, Tom's going to cut it off. That one. Um, okay, so public comment is where the board, we listen, we, we do not give feedback. Uh, uh, it's a very important part of our decision making process. Um, and I know sometimes it can feel a little awkward for you to speak and for us not to answer, but that's the point of public comment is not back and forth. Um, wish we had mics, because if we have to talk this way, no one's going to understand anything. Um, not for us teachers. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of you here on the budget, we do have uh, new information on the budget that um, will be shared next meeting or this meeting? This meeting. This meeting. Um, my understanding is the information is good and we probably do not have to make any huge decisions this year. So I just want to put that out there, uh, which is good because we don't like to make huge decisions uh, in a rushed manner. Um, how many people here want to speak? Because we have a certain number I'm going to put a time. OK. Um, I'm going to give each person one minute to speak. I'm going to use a timer. I'm going to give you a two signal for 10 seconds and a one signal for five. Uh, when you see the 10, please um, go to your conclusion. So that way, uh, you know, any, any points you want to wrap up with, you know, that's your signal to, um, to get there. So, uh, I know one minute isn't a ton of time. Um, you know, again, I think ways to avoid that. You know, if someone said something you want, you can just agree with them. You don't have to repeat it. Uh, but one minute is generally generally enough. Um, and I won't cut you off right at one minute, but I will let you finish a sentence or two. Um, can we just encourage folks too? If you're not done with your messaging, you still have more yeah. to add that you could address the board at large via email. Yes. Um, which is schoolboard at mpsvt.org um, if you can't get it yeah. all out in one minute or so. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You don't think this is too controversial, I think, to time limit us in mean, closing the school? Is that what we're talking about here? Yes or no? Well, as I just said, we are, we do not have to make any major decisions this year. This is going to be a long conversation. We don't have to have it tonight, so I think if everyone gets a minute, we can make our point. There's, but we have the time before I make any huge decision like that to have a lot of time for input and not input. So um, this is not going to be our time to speak. As Kristen said, uh, we all receive email. Uh, let's put it this way. There is, there is absolutely no live proposal right now to close any of our four schools. None. Zero. Um, a lot of things are, oh, that's great. Um, you know, as we go through the budgeting process, there are a lot of things that are going to be considered. Um, none of them have been put on the table right now. So this is, you know, if, if that were put on the table, uh, we would get as much input about that decision as possible. Um, there is 
again, no proposal to close any of our schools right now. What is this meeting? Hey, David, I would be willing to meet with you after yeah. the meeting. If an email is not, you know, a meeting yeah. that's going to work for you, Rhett and or I yeah. would be happy just, to sit down yeah, with you just, and, and update you. Yeah, and just... And uh, I want to say I want the people of town to hear. Yeah. yeah. It, it, live it, now. It, 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 so, you know, I got like a page and a half handwritten double space. Okay. It's not going to take more than a couple minutes. Okay. But to put time frames on is ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. It is ridiculous. We don't have a hundred people here. You know, you're worried about getting home real early or what? Dude, this is people have the right to have their say. This is a public meeting, is it not? It's a public meeting, but that the public meetings have rules, as do other venues. And just to, and just to again, um, build off of that, the purpose of today's meeting is to hear a presentation on the data yes. of, of yes. academic and social emotional learning yes. in our schools, and so that's the let's we want to make sure we have plenty of time for that in the agenda yes, because there's yes. good information there and good questions for the board to be yes. asking and the public to be asking. Yeah, so, so I missed something somewhere. Is this a regular school board meeting? Is that it's a regular school board meeting, yes. It has nothing to do with closing the school? Correct. Correct. Why was that put out? I, I Why do all these that. people believe that this, this was a meeting about closing the school? Be because we have, because of a new law, we are going to receive less money from the state than we've received previously, which means that over the next few years, we may face some cuts. That's that's why the I, that's why the possibility of closing Roxbury has been put out into the the public conversation. Again, there is no live proposal to do it. The board is not actively considering it right now, and by all accounts, given the numbers we have, this is not a decision we would have to make this year. Is it a possibility in future years? Yes. Was it a possibility in future years two years ago? Yes. Um, so yeah, again, this is this is not a meeting about closing the Roxbury School. This is a regular school board meeting. This is part of our budget process. Obviously, you know, I think the, the budget numbers, we've had very lucky budget numbers over the last several years. We have not had we've been able to, to grow our budget with very little tax implications. Uh, we're not in that position now. So I, I think there's understandable nervousness among the public about what that means, what that's gonna mean going forward. I think that's why there is the concern that we see in the room. But do we have an active proposal to close Roxbury? Absolutely not. No. Are you going to discuss it here? No. We, we will hear comment on it, and this will be part of our process. But all we will discuss tonight are the data presentations. We will get some update on budget numbers. And, and let me just preface this. Like, this is something we are taking very seriously. Nobody wants to close RVS. It is not a desire of anyone on the board. Again, it's not something we're actively considering, but we are going to be in a budget situation where we are going to have to consider likely cuts over the next four to five years. And is that a possibility? Yes, it's, it's a lot of other programs are possibilities too. Um, so a lot of tough decisions and obviously we want to get initial thoughts. The reason I'm living it to a minute is because we don't have a live proposal. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for input. We would like to get some initial impressions about what the Roxbury community feels in general about whatever you want to talk about. It doesn't have to be closing Roxbury, it can be any concerns, but I'm living it to a minute because we have staff here that has put together a, a presentation. They, we need time for that presentation. That presentation is a very important part of our uh, budgeting process and our process in general. We're going to see how we're doing academically. Um, and, but we also want to give time for public comment. And part of the, the rules of a public meeting is, is to balance that. And, and a minute for what I saw was about 10 to 15 people speaking seems to be fair with the idea that there will probably be some people who are going to go 10, 15 seconds over. I'm not going to, there's not a, you know, a hatch in the, the bottom of the floor that's, that's going to open up if, if you, you know, go to uh, 61 seconds. You still don't get it. You don't get it. It's not American to limit speech. Where the hell is your brain? Okay. Well, uh, seriously, think about it. Why would you want to limit anybody's speech? This is a free country. You people come into these meetings and the selectmen are doing the same damn thing. Try to pinhole time slots for people to make them forget what they're saying, to make them not 
be able to fully express themselves. That's crap. It's and crap. You know it. Well, I also know that the House of Representatives gives our limited five representatives minutes. five minutes. Exactly. Yeah. It's a limited time. Five minutes. It's not, not one minute. Well, great. Well, here tonight we're doing a minute. Don't even look at me. I don't even want to hear it. Great. Um, I'm not talking to you. Would someone talk to the chair? Jim, can, do you mind if I just say one thing? Yeah, also, please do. I want to remind people on Zoom, too, that if they're interested yes. in public comment, that they should probably raise their hand sooner rather than later so that we can also gauge how many people are online that yeah. want to speak. Um, Which, but I, I just want to validate people from Roxbury's yeah. um, knee-jerk reaction to the information that was provided, the very limited information that was provided up to this point. And yeah. driving in tonight, I was like, I bet there will be a lot of people there tonight wanting to hear about whether um, Roxbury Village School is being considered as in part of the budget cuts. So based on what was discussed at last meeting, and based on what was sort of yeah. signaled by various um, people in the community, including board members, I'm not surprised that, that there are you know, rumors circulating in the Roxbury community especially about the potential closure of the school. So it's not, to me, it's not surprising that you're here. I want to hear from people in Roxbury. I want to know what people are thinking in this community around this issue. And um, so it's not, I just want to validate you know, your feeling that maybe this meeting was a, a little bit about that in a roundabout way. And I would urge you to watch last week's, or two weeks ago, that meeting. Because in that meeting, a lot of the information was sort of clarified, and basically, it was said publicly that there won't be a closure of Roxbury in this upcoming budget, most likely. And then the data that's going to be presented, the numbers later tonight, basically are so different from what was presented last time that it's no longer a concern to cut the budget by the amount of money that we were talking about last time. But I think the last time we did, and I don't want to take too much time on this, but I think the last time that we did convene, we actually, that we, that, that was the possibility that it was thrown out. Yes, Libby yes. Was, was advised and we had to different go ahead. Numbers. The next time that we would come back, one of the budget models that we would see would be looking at what would the cost yeah. savings be of sending RVS students to UES. So it is a current issue. Tonight's yes. meeting, the primary focus is a academic, social, emotional, behavioral, uh, you know, absenteeism. So, so Dave, I will be happy to follow up with you, but the, and this may be different than House Select to Board to meetings. Talk to her. Okay, so we can do that outside of this, but it's not, we receive public comment. Everybody receives their, in, in yes. tonight's case, because we have a great number of people here, which is fabulous. It's one yeah. minute allocated per person. Yeah, I'll give you my one minute right now. Uh, so I didn't. I don't do the computer. Okay, I don't have a phone that slip my kids do. I don't do that. I got the information secondhand that you were going to close the school, and this was a meeting about it. Okay, that's all I know. Thank you. I was just going to say, I think what part of the problem is... Can we just, do you want to just start the public comment? Or well, go ahead, go ahead. What, no, I was just going to tell you, at the last select board meeting, I was under the impression that Roxbury and Stowe were definitely being closed. And that's where I think some of this confusion mm -hmm. came yeah. from. Yeah, it's, I, I understand the confusion. I understand that, you know, I want to kind of validate Emma's point. You know, Budget numbers are, are scary. It, it definitely was floated at the last minute meeting, given the numbers we were seeing at the last meeting, which have changed favorably. And one of the things is if those numbers held, which they haven't, that this might be a possibility we would want to look at, uh, along with some other possibilities that would involve some other programs. We are. We knew when the red happened that this was a possibility. What was that? We knew when the red started, you know, when the consolidation started, that it was a possibility this school would close. So it looms over our head like the sword of Damocles. You get it? Yeah. I absolutely get it. I, and I, I understand how much this school means to the community, and I was part of the merger committee. No one wants to close this school. Um, yeah, it's, and, and, I, and I, understand, I understand the angst, and we want to hear about the angst. Uh, but we do not have to, we are very fortunate in that we almost certainly do not have to make that decision this year. But let's, you know, but we wanted, we want to 
cure the conversation. Um, and I think, honestly, the, the more time we have to have the conversation, the more input the board gets from Roxbury uh, about the concerns and the considerations, the more intelligent a decision we're going to make for the district and for both communities. So I, with that, I would really like, do we have folks online? Looks like... Yeah, lots, but I don't see any raised hands. Yeah, I don't see any raised hands. Um, oh, wait. Yep, Lucinda Sullivan. Okay, is, so we have, is either waving at us or raising her hand. Okay. So um, do we want people to come to the table for microphone purposes? It, yeah, I and I think it would be nice. So when you do make public comment, come yeah. to the table. Yeah, so please, um, you know, self-select, uh, you know, please just, you can either form a line now or just come up one after the other, which is where it's easiest. Um, yeah, and I'll, again, I will, I will, do the timer in the warning. Um, I'm not going to be a total stickler about it, but just just to be fair to people and to make sure everyone gets heard, okay. that the, the people, the presentation and we folks have. Folks, be sure to state your name so that the woman who's taking yes. the name. My name is Jane Pincus. I've lived in Roxbury for over 50 years. Uh, my children uh, went up through the system, up uh, to, in, into Northfield through eighth grade here. I, I just want to say um, I really appreciate that we ha we're having a discussion about all this. I want to say that for all of these years, whether my kids have gone to school or not, the school has been like one of the heartbeats of our town, and we really, really want to keep it going. We'll do, I'll do anything I can to, to, to do what's necessary to help keep the school going and becoming and be, being a vivid part of the town's life. This is, this is a town that needs a lot of heartbeats in it, and the school is incredibly important. I've also been a teacher for one year in this school. I taught art, so I talk as, and I am a teacher, so I speak as a former teacher. We've had some wonderful things happen in the school, and the school has offered a tremendous amount to the community and still does and still can. And it, it really deserves your attention, your care, our care, and community support as much as possible. And I really appreciate the kinds of clarifications that you made tonight about what you're doing. So anyway, I thank you. And I hope this is going to be a continuing discussion between all of us. Great. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Jen. My name's Christy. I live over in East Roxbury. I've always been curious why we merged with Montpelier since we're like a mile over the Roxbury line, so it's way closer for us to go to Northfield. Like that's always been a concern of mine, now that I have kids. Oh. Christy, what's your last name? I'm sorry. Uh, Safford. Stafford? Uh, Safford. Safford. Okay, no thank you. Okay, I'll a minute. Oh, I, I, I'm her mother. And she went to Roxbury to sixth grade and then to Northfield. To me, it makes more sense to let the people choose. I don't see any reason why we need to ship the kids a half an hour to Montpelier. Because right now, her, her daughter's in Williamstown. She didn't have a preschool. I don't see why we shouldn't have a choice not to send them to Montpelier. It's too long of a bus ride. Expect a little kid to ride all the way over there. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Andrea. Andrea Zapper. Andrea Erno. Erno. E R N O. Just for the notes. Great. Anything else? You've got a couple seconds. And my other question is, if you wouldn't let us go to Northfield or Williamstown, how do you find out how much to do it, to, to, tuition would be to send them there instead of having them to go to Montpelier? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. You can email her. I can tell you that. Okay, yes. I can't hear. Yeah, she will, if you can answer with an email, her email is Libby, L I B B Y B, at mpsvt.org. Can you hear that? Yeah.
Thank you. It's on, it's on the website, too. Andrea, are your children in school now, here? What you say? Uh, no, I'm, I, I'm her kid, and I went here way back when we were merged with Northfield. Okay. So my kid's going to come here next year. Okay, thank you. And we want to go to Northfield. We don't want her want her shipped all the way to Montpelier. Yeah. I don't see the point of that. We live like one mile over the line, which is kind of crazy. Thank you. Great, thank you. Christy, I wrote her email down for you. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. There you go. Great, again, please state your name for the camera. Hi, my name is Olga Sinkova, and I attended fourth grade at the Robespierre Village School. That school year 2020-2021 was, was at the beginning of the pandemic. I had just moved to Vermont and everything was very new and scary. Roxbury Village School was really important to me during that year. It was a school that taught me not only math and English, but also taught me the history of where I am now living. We went outdoors all the time and learned how to observe the nature around us. As the season changed, I really felt a new connection to Roxbury. It's people in the natural world around us. I still notice and remember the early spring flowers that we learned, we learned about and the tracks in the snow like the ones we identified on our rocks with our teacher. Having that connection to the place where you live is really important. I think that connection happens when you're a kid. It gave me a sense of community and belonging. Roxbury Village School is down the mountain in the village where the streets, from the streets where I live. It is close by and accessible. The school is the heart of Roxbury and it is a really important part of this community. Great, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Like a perfect minute, too. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Wayne Holt. I live in uh, East Roxbury. East Roxbury. Um, I have four pages. I'll try to condense it down to a minute here. I don't think we have so much a um, money problem as we have an allocation problem. And with you people on the budget, uh, the, the things that I see is we've got too many social programs and stuff that we do that siphons off the money, and there's not enough money left for education. And for example, I know that the state is giving away free lockable storage bags to people to bring home to store their pot in so the kids can't get to it. And to the tune of $20,000, I called today to see what that cost. Um, to me, that's a bad use of money. And um, you know, the, it's funny that the bags say healthy at home on them, you know, and most of these people that have drug addicted parents, don't, they're not healthy. Um, the other thing is the money that we spend on Narcan and, and giving away uh, free syringes and things like that to drug addicts. I think that's a waste of money because these people make a decision for that lifestyle. It's not up for us taxpayers to have to deal with that. And so, uh, you know, if you're a diabetic, you've got to pay for your syringes. And if you're a drug addict, you get them for free. Um, the other thing is that we've spent $455 million in the last six years on the homeless problem. And that, that money could be well allocated to the educational system instead of taking it away from y'all. They should give you some of that. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the numbers of people go up every year. There's 10,275 people that have with, taken advantage of the homeless stuff over the last six years. For, if you divide that $455 million out, that's $44,000 a piece. And I, I think that money could be used in the educational system. So um, that's, I guess my minute is up. But, I, you know, if you people are on the budget committee, y'all should try to fight for some of that money and just say, we need the money because we're, we're watching out for our children. And we don't think you ought to be going for things like that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, if you want to uh, you know, send your remarks either by email or if you don't have that email, you can... Yeah, leave them with us or leave them with Kristen. Yeah. Thank you. Is anyone else in the room? Yeah. My name is Vasis. And I attended the Roxbury Village School. What I remember the most was planting kale, chard, pears, and other vegetables. We dug up the soil in the beds, made rolls, and planted the seeds. The garden was part of our playground. Every time we went outside for recess, I would see how everything was growing. 
The seeds turned into little sprouts, the sprouts turned into small plants, and then they grew and grew. At the end of our school year, each kid received a box with vegetables that we grew and the recipe for soup. I brought my box home and helped my parents make a soup. The soup was really tasty. Watching vegetables grow and then making food with those vegetables was really new to me. It also made me wonder if I could grow something as well. Roxbury Village School taught me that farming is not something that um, that happens in California. It can happen here in Roxbury as well. This year helped my parents build. This year I helped my parents build a greenhouse. Despite the rainy summer, I grew lots of cucumbers and tomatoes. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Ben Pincus, and I'm a proud graduate of Roxbury Village School. Um, if I had more than one minute, I'd quote my uh, third grade Christmas pageant line, which I remembered from 1978. So you can ask me afterwards what that line is. <laughs> so, um, but I just want to say that the school's really important. We didn't, uh, we took our children out of the school. Um, uh, a number of years ago, or rather my older son campaigned to be taken out. So that's a part of another story that I really like to share with you guys if and when there's a brainstorming session that comes up with regards to just thoughts and ideas and revitalizing, making RBS a special place. I want to thank all of you guys for, I know, having to grapple with really hard issues. So thank you. Um, I know it's been a struggle. And I just want to say, I go back far enough with the school when it was a two-room schoolhouse. And uh, with Miss Hannah, Hannah Morvan, for what, first through third grades, and then Mr. Smith, Rich Smith, for the following grades. And, and I want to really emphasize, especially for young children, for elementary school children, how wonderful a rural Vermont education is in a small school. And to lose that would be a terrible loss to history, our history of New England, our legacy as a, a rural state. Um, and I just want to say that'd be a terrible tragedy. And it would be a real loss to the, this community, where I think the school has really been the center. Um, and um, and it's, even being in this room is giving me flashbacks to that Christmas pageant in my single room. So just want to thank you all for your work. And I also am curious to know if, are there other schools like us in um, smaller villages that have hooked on as part of the merger um, and are in really similar situations. That just would be one question I have for all of you guys to find out if there's other similar situations like that. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dottie Guifre, and I was a teacher here in the school for eight years. So I have very fond feelings about the school and what it accomplishes in our community. But I wanted to put down in writing something that's short and gives you an idea of what it would mean if the school were not here, just to put into your planning and thinking. Without our school, no happy sounds of kids on the playground, no parents chatting as they drop off their kids in the morning, only parents who work outside Roxbury rushing home to meet the bus in time because there's no after school, no rhythm of learning in Roxbury for all to feel each day, no pride in community, it will disappear without our school. Preschoolers no longer imagine themselves old enough to go to preschool next year. There's no preschool for them when no early childhood teacher was hired for the little ones. And the school is abandoned as a place of learning. How sad for all the little ones who lost their chance to learn here because of a dispute over dollars and cents in a budget. How short-sighted to say, Put them on the bus. They can learn in another town. 
How ignorant to think that disrupting every family with school-aged children each day will be okay. This is not the answer to leave Roxbury Village without this symbol of learning and pride. To thoughtlessly deny the damage it will do to our effort to revitalize Roxbury. No responsible adult would make this choice for our community by reducing possibilities for our future and by ignoring the pride we have in our village's history. And who will plant and tend the raised gardens that students built and tended when the village school is ended? Please do not leave us without our school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Yeah. Yeah. There's someone else ahead of me. My name is James Ray. I'm a, a father of two boys at Montpelier High School. Um, I just want to put out to, uh, it's related to the folks behind me, <laughs> um, and, and all the citizens, uh, I think to join me in doing the research, there's, I'll put it this way, there's ample research out there in the world connecting the health of a school system to the health of a town, the economic health, I mean. Um, and I raise that because the people who aren't in this room, people out in the community who need to be convinced to keep the schools here, this school and the three buildings in Montpelier uh, healthy and vital in the coming years despite budget pressures, um, there is ample evidence out there in the world, even just a cursory search on my part, uh, has turned up study after study connecting the health of a school, a building like this in Roxbury, buildings like those in Montpelier, to the economic vitality of the towns that they are in. Um, my point being that there's a tendency, especially with folks who don't have a direct stake in a school, to see them as a money sink, when in fact I think the research shows that they are actually quite the opposite. And I would encourage everyone to join me in my Google searches for those studies, arm ourselves with that knowledge because I think it's gonna be really important for our fellow community members um, who don't have a direct stake in the school to know that they actually do have a direct economic stake in healthy and vital schools in our towns. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room or? Um, miscommunication, I came here to uh, think about closing the school. However, I'm not happy with this situation. Um, and why I'm not happy with it is because this rotten idea of a red eliminated what Ben Pink is needed desperately in school, which is school choice. He got to go, go to U32, as did most of our students that went somewhere else. Nobody, only one person that I know of ever went to Montpelier. She became a music teacher. Her mother and father are lawyers. They live here, some part-time. Nobody ever went to Montpelier. It turns out that we were not allowed to go to U32 because Montpelier needed enough students to make up a red. Ain't that great? Why didn't they get, the, why didn't they get students from around Neck of Montpelier? Because it's too high a tax town. None of them towns wanted to be with Montpelier. We got stuck with it. Thank you very much for listening. The red is a bad idea. That's why certain towns have got rid of it. And by the way, uh, Barnard, a fairly well town, just picked theirs a year or so ago. They didn't let the state bulldoze them in 2014 or whenever it was. You know, you don't push around a money town, but you push around a little town, pissant town like Roxbury. Just lovely. Thank you very much for this. Things need to be said. Hello, thank you for being here. My name is Arthur Smith. Um, for 15 years, I was uh, an education law attorney 
and I represented kids uh, from the ages of 3 to 21. And primarily, what I was focusing on would be out-of-district placements, the most expensive items typically in the budget, ranging around 300000 a year per student. So really tracking down what brings a student to a situation where they feel so alienated and um, so unable to benefit from their school, uh, local school. And typically what I found it was uh, a long process of not um, being able to connect with peers, not being able to be a part of the community. And why I'm mentioning all of this now as I was talking with my niece, she is finishing her doctorate at Stanford, I said, it's really curious the situation we're in. Um, it's really difficult for our school to be able to find the individuals they need to staff it, and it's hard to bring specialists in. But somehow the disconnect seems to be ever present that we're losing out. And she said, there's a body of literature that you probably should look at. It's called mattering. And it's really uh, the idea of self-concept. And I don't, um, I don't know this literature, but I started reading it and thinking about tonight. And really what it had to do with was self-concept. It doesn't have to do with self-esteem or social support. It has to do with how you feel in relationship to others. That's what our school is. Um, our school is the relationships that are built and thrive, and the sense of being someone that matters. And I guess that's a concern that I would have, and I think that's why she put me on to this. When students go from a small setting to a larger setting, that may be what we're losing, the sense that I matter. And so I guess in pondering the testing scores, and maybe that's true. In fact, I had a discussion with someone today who posed these questions to me. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Um, well, maybe the test scores would go up. And I guess that's the real balancing act. You know, what do you lose? Maybe the test scores go up, but that self-concept, that feeling of matter, where does that fit in? And I guess when I think about those $300,000 placements, that's a real... Um, budget item. And so when you start tracking down how, to, how can you prevent that, how can you get people in the community, I think it starts with very fundamental issues. How do we instill a sense of belonging? Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? I think we have one person on line. Uh, yes. One last thing. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it's still happening, but I think Granville and Hancock closed their schools, and, and I think everybody goes to Rochester or someone, I'm not sure. But I think maybe you ought to just see how it goes down there as a piece of information before you even think about closing the school. Thank you. Um. Good. We'll, we'll definitely look into it. Um, See how they're making out now, you know what I mean? Get an idea or overview of what's going on. Yeah, I think we're going to try to give Lucinda here a chance. I, I'm yes. unmuted. Oh, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, first of all, thank, thank you for all your hard work. I'm, I'm Lucinda Sullivan. I've lived in the community for um, over 40 years. My four kids have gone through Roxbury and uh, had saw it as one of their best parts of their education because it's a small school and you end up mattering. And um, I was on the school board for quite a while. So I do have a heart for this school and I think the community has a heart and it's uh, the hub of Roxbury and it's the heart of Roxbury. And I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, I am troubled by sending kids to, all the way to Montpelier. I, under, I understand why. 
but in thinking about what we're going to do with the school in the future, I think that's a very important um, thing to think about with little children on the bus being taken out of their community when they need to create community here. Um, I, I agree with all that all the things that people have said this evening, and I'm not going to repeat them. I look forward to lots of discussions, hopefully community discussions about how we go forward or how the this district goes forward with all of its schools, but for our interest, this school in particular. Um, I would like the board to consider um, looking at alternative uses for the school. I think that could be a very, very outside of the box way of looking at education. There's certainly a lot of um, ways of doing education. I think kids need to have that opportunity. I, um, I especially appreciate uh, James Ray's comments. Thank you for that, because I think Roxbury's on the edge of making some changes, and I think the school is an important part of that. But thank you all for doing all the work you're doing, and I appreciate um, the extra time we have to consider this. Great. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, anyone else online? Great. No, thanks, everyone. Uh, the comment was very, very helpful. Uh, and um, you know, this is a conversation I think we're going to have uh, more robustly. Um, and I liked Lucinda's comment about seeing if we can find you know, other ways to use this building to maybe ensure the long-term viability of it. Because I, I definitely agree with, with Jamie that um, these are the type of institutions that make a community and make a town. I think everyone on the board knows that. Um, so next on the item is our consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Do I hear yes? I move we approve the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? I just have a couple of questions. Um, Libby, in your superintendent report, you yeah. mentioned you're anticipating something at the legislative level around literacy. Could you say a couple more sentences about that, or is it still? I'm anticipating the people who are actively working to ensure um, a certain type of reading or a certain type of instruction to be in all schools legislated uh -huh. will come back. OK. That's what I mean. And then um, there was the district's local assessment plan is linked in the, I know this is not from the consent agenda, but I was just, it's a request um, that seems to fit better here, linked in the fall data report. And I'm just curious to know where folks could find the local assessment plan on our website, because I, I didn't know where it was. Okay, great. I guess that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Under Mike's department, curriculum. <laughs> the curriculum department and then assessment. Curriculum and then assessment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have student presentation on... Um, Jim, can we just... I, I just feel like sometimes at board meetings when lots of people come who don't regularly attend board meetings, that it might be worth explaining sort of what the trajectory of the meeting is and they can make a decision of whether they want to stay for the rest of the meeting or not. <laughs> you know uh, what I mean? Yeah, no, I, Sometimes I there's like sure. sort of an awkward moment where it's like, when do we leave? Is there anything going to be discussed? That sort of thing. Uh, we are largely discussing um, the data on academic performance for the remainder of the evening. Uh, Libby will, I think, say a few words updating the budget, which I think you caught the gist of, which is we've gotten uh, different numbers from the state, which means that we do not have to make cuts that we anticipated making this year. It does not mean that we are out of the bag for the next four or five years, but this year uh, we do not have to make any um, drastic or decronian cuts, um, and we can pretty much, I think, have a level budget and delay harder choices till next year when we have a good year to have conversations about where those choices <laughs> might be made and some of those choices might be we just all live with much higher taxes. Um, 
So if you're interested in the, the data presentation, uh, please stick around. If you want to see how the board meeting goes, please stick around. Um, if you want to do other things with your evening, this is probably a, a good time uh, to leave if you're so inclined. But everyone is welcome to stay. So um, there will be a budget. Act 127 budget update, update but yes. it's not substantial. It's, it's not. It's, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it is that we are able to use numbers that keep us within. Does it make, I mean, I want to be respectful of, to everybody's time because yeah. we have a lot of staff people that are here that don't live in this yes. community and have long drives home. Yeah. And then we have people that came to yeah. be a part of the community or part of the yeah. meeting. So I just wonder if it makes sense to like, I mean, you basically just did that flip flop the agenda. Looks like most people. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Ahead of the data. Okay. okay. Libby wants to do the stat. I, I think we gave everyone the, okay. the, the gist of what they need to know. Um, <clears throat> all right. Thank you for being patient. I know that was. Um, Alara is that first, though. Alara. Yeah, students. Okay. Is she on Zoom? I was Alara wondering where the students here. were. Okay, Alara, Alara do you yes. have a presentation, my friend? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of a short one. Um, Miriam and I have been putting our heads together, and we're coming up with a plan to uh, have TAs come together. And because uh, we held like a budget listening session a few weeks ago, and we got we kind of met after that and talked about our next steps and. We made a plan to send like a small script to TAs and have each student kind of individually write out their thoughts and then we'll collect them and we'll put them together and we'll be able to present that here. Um, other than that, we're nearing break. Things are kind of winding down. Um, we're doing some like grateful grams at our school where students and teachers can send like personalized notes and treats to each other to show that we're thankful for each other in the community and yeah so just we're all very grateful for each other lately thanks alara thanks alara thank you alara yeah and, and sorry i almost I wasn't seeing you in the room so um excellent uh so now thank you everyone for being patient i think we're actually technically on time so um Slide some chairs over, guys. Yeah, slide some chairs over, and um, yeah, and I'm excited to see this presentation. The uh, the amount of data in the packet is impressive, and obviously some questions to ask, but very, very thorough. Jim, I see that. Obviously, I'm just not sure if uh, they might have missed public comment, or maybe it's an accidental hand. I just have one question. Yeah, I mean, because we had a broad comment, I mean, we usually don't do, we usually don't have an open meeting once we get past public comment, but I'll, I'll go ahead because I, I know that you're a expert community. Do you normally have the chat turned off the entire time? Yes. Or is it because you don't have an administrator dealing with chats? Okay. We normally have it turned off. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Um, I do want to say that. Email is a way to deliver messages to us, um, so please do that. But uh, they'll be, I think, have typically have the chat turned off. Uh, but thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> go ahead. Do we have, we don't have a projector here, right? We don't, but Shannon gave out copies. Okay, yeah. Let me just pull it up, guys. Thanks, Shane. So we have Nick Connor, our community liaison, Peggy Sivan Ostrin, our director of special services, Mike Berry, our director of teaching and technology, or I'm sorry, curriculum and technology. I changed your title. And Jess Murray, the director of social emotional learning and wellness up. 
the, in the board packet, you got a much deeper dive into data um, that has new stuff in it, new data in it. So um, the team here is going to explain a few bits of it. And the, the PowerPoint is more of a high overview of, of the packet that the board received. So Mike, I believe you're starting us off. Sure. My new title and everything. <laughs> Um, so just to thank you for having us, to walk through the report that you received, um, that first page has a lot of demographic information uh, current to a couple of weeks ago. The big thing I'd point out there is to look at the free and reduced lunch information. That process has changed this year significantly and our numbers look way different than they have in the past. There's a link to a spot on our website that explains the new process for free and reduced lunch um, considerations. It's just an interesting dynamic. Nick and I are tracking that on a weekly basis now. Did so. it reduce it? Yeah, increased it pretty significantly. Um, and then into the academics. Um, some of this you have seen before. Um, just to walk through what we have in here, we have um, BT cap is currently embargoed until the AOE releases that those results formally. Um, we've heard estimates of December. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a little bit later than that. Uh, that's, that's what we know right now. And then we have some information about Renaissance Star um, that you can see in there. And I'm sure we'll have time for some questions about those considerations. Um, what I really wanted to share was some of the new information in here. What we wanted to do for the board and the community tonight was be able to show some of the diagnostic level assessments that we use to really tailor instruction, intervention, and supports for students. And so you can see a lot of those things that are new um, to our district this year and really implementing with fidelity. Uh, one of those being a running record assessment that really tells us about students' word recognition, uh, fluency, and comprehension. And we're working on understanding where our students are at in their reading progressions and what levels they are at. It's really great information for us. There's a really fancy chart that I'm quite proud of for the uh, words their way spelling inventory. Um, and just to give a little context, the names at the top of that chart, letter name within word patterns, syllables and affixes, derivational relations, that's a progression of learning for students um, from beginning to end in terms of spelling. And the highlighted sections are the end of year expected results. So you can get a sense of what we saw this fall. The really great thing with this assessment for teachers is that it gives them a really immediate sense of where their students are at and how to tailor instruction and supports. And that's really the power of these diagnostic assessments is that we get really great information about our students very quickly um, and we're able to act on it immediately. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. And then you see some math foundational skills assessments. Uh, we currently give these to grades five through nine, although we're working on some ideas for elementary as well. Each one of these skills that you see is representative of one question on a skills quiz. So this isn't a super deep, you know, this is how our math programming is going. This is another tool that our teachers use to get a quick dipstick into how the court class is and how individual students are showing up. And so we use this for our planning, we use this for uh, SST groups at the middle school. We use it for intervention planning. Um, and it's just a great way for us to use diagnostic information to really serve and support students. Um, so we're very excited about that. But this is one of the things, um, back to the presentation, that was big for us. We have a new local assessment plan that's really um, connected and vertically aligned and we put it into motion this fall and we learned a lot from that process. We're going to change things up in the winter um, administration to make things a little bit smoother. Uh, but it was a great move for us as a district to be able to align across the schools and across the grade levels and to really start to have those supported conversations with uh, classroom teachers and students around what are the needs and how can, how can we support students in their learning. So it's very exciting. Um, and we want to continue to improve upon that. Each time we do it, we learn a little bit more about how to be more efficient, how to collect the data, how to gather the data, how to share the data. Um, so we want to continue to iterate upon that. We also um, really want to find a, another math diagnostic um, in K through 12. So 
For math, we have Renaissance Star, the screener that gives us screening information about students. And then we have the skills assessment, which gives us a quick look at students' mathematical skills. We need something in the middle a little bit with a little bit more depth. So we're looking into some assessments that we can do K through 12 that give us that more understanding of a mathematical thinker for our students. So that's a big focus for us this year in terms of our local assessment plan. Um, uh, Dennis has a presentation for I think yep. Jane has a question. I'm also wondering how you want us to queue questions. Do you want us to have questions to go on or do you want us to kind of wait for little times when you kind of... I think for me, if I can just go through okay. kind of the updates on the slide and then questions for me and then we can move to... Oh, yeah, you know, I know you probably have hundreds of questions for Nick, so I want to make sure I get them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. okay, that's perfect. We'll do that. Then. Okay. Um, uh, another big thing for us this year was the implementation of Panorama across all schools, which has been really amazing um, in so many ways. Uh, and that impacts all of us and all of our, our roles. Um, so we've been working with uh, classroom teachers, we've been working with principals, and we've all been learning from Panorama, but the immediate thing that we see right away is just this incredible access to uh, our students' information for our teachers. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty incredible. Um, one of the other things and areas of growth that we're looking at, I didn't mean to use growth there, but um, we want to find data to accurately measure growth and the impact of the work that we're doing. Uh, on the slide, there's an example of a new feature in Renaissance Star. And just to be clear, the reason that I put this on here was to show that there's a new feature in Renaissance Star and that we are actively looking for ways to measure growth. This one, we don't know enough about to be able to say this is the best measure of growth um, in terms of using this. However, Julie Conrad, the middle school principal, also has a little bit of a math brain, just in, in case you didn't know. Um, and she's been looking at different ways to measure growth as well. So we're, we're working as an administrative team to understand how can we look at growth and measure growth um, in, a, in an efficient way, in an accessible way. So that's a big focus for us this year as well. And then um, a big win for us at the end of last year was we updated our reporting measures and proficiency scales in literacy and mathematics, K through 12. That's all on our website as well. Um, that was significant work, and that lends to our ability to respond to student needs, to report out to parents and families and students on their learning, um, to continue to align our curriculum, K through 12. It was, it was a, a big thing. It was a big geeky thing in my world um, that we're, we're quite happy with and will continue to, to grow from there. That's my list. I'm good. Great. Thanks. Um, questions for Yeah. My question um, is... Um, Basically, like, how are you? How are you using this data? Like, when I see um, test, these are tests that are given to get these results. Like, I think, you know, how does this compare to other school districts? I think about how does this compare to our school district in prior years? Um, is that how you you guys are using this stuff too, or is it some? Is this not how you are using it? I think there are certain assessments that speak to that. So VT CAP would be an example where we get comparative data to other districts in the state. We just can't talk about it yet because it's super secret. Um, and so when that comes out, we do get some good information about how we're comparing. And sometimes even nationally, like with SBAC, we were able to look nationally and see certain trends and things like that. Renaissance Star has some components of comparative data that we can do with state and national benchmarks. Um, it has not been super helpful for us to do that yet. Um, and I think now that the state has changed up the tests that we're using. So Renaissance Star used SBAC as a frame of reference for our um, national comparison. And however, that's not the assessment we're using now. So I don't know how that tool is going to work to help us really understand it, anything within Renaissance Stars in terms of national comparison. Um, but locally, the way that we use these is as part of our collaborative team structure and our guiding coalitions and our PLCs. So teachers um, administer an assessment and then in teaching teams sit and review and discuss what our student needs and how are we gonna support that. And that extends to intervention supports, it extends to all of us in some way and our roles and be able to do that. And we're doing that on a regular cycle and basis. Um, so that's, that's how we're using the data. Okay, and super quick follow up. Um, 
like rounding for grade five, the proficiency is 76%, um, which, and it's a highlighted skill. That, so it's the, currently the focus of the small group of class, but converting between fractions and decimals, proficiency is 7%. Mm -hmm. So how, who decides, like, you know, do we focus on rounding or do we focus on fractions to decimals? Yeah, so one of the things that we need to figure out a way to report better is that some of these skills haven't been introduced yet. Right. Okay. It was, this was the first week of school when this was administered. So fractions may not be introduced until the middle of the school year, and it's perfectly appropriate for 7% to be the number. The other thing to remember is that this is one question on a 24-question quiz. So there's one fractions question. So this is just a quick you know, check-in with students. This is not a comprehensive kind of deep mathematical three-hour test. Um, so this is just a quick, where do I need to go with my students? What yeah. do we do with our, our it's groups? It's like a formative beginning of That's year right. kind of thing. Got it. Yep. And kind of a somewhat follow-up. You know, the, the testing has shifted over the years. I mean, we've gone from you know, kneecap to SBAC, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, and also, my understanding is the administration of the latest test was kind of statewide, not as smooth as it could have been. I mean, how does that impact the ability, like the usefulness of the data? Honestly, it seems it seems that you're you're shifting. It makes longitudinal comparisons difficult. It might make year-to-year -year comparisons difficult if you've got hiccups in the administration of the test that are influencing results. Yeah. Uh, so I can, I can speak to my opinion of, of things and then some information that we have. Um, the rollout of the uh, Cogni assessment in our district was extremely difficult and at times very unsuccessful. Um, I've, met, yeah, <laughs> I've met with families um, who are concerned about the results and I've been very honest about that to say I can't prove or disprove that your students' results were or were not impacted by this. But I know we had more tears than I've ever seen in an administration of a, a, a national assessment or state assessment from staff and students. I was say students and um, it, was, it was very, very unsmooth. Um, from implementation to rollout, I, I think I was at a full day training one week before we were administering this. It was, it was awful. It, it, everything that you could do wrong was, was done. So um, they are doing an, a study to see the um, comparative alignment between SBAC and Cognia. I don't know what that will give us. I think that the sense is like, it, it, are the scores in, in Cognia aligned with what we're used to in SBAC and that will help us understand it more. Um, we still don't have uh, release tasks from the state, which is um, <coughs> basically a way for us to look at what the assessment looks like, to see what the questions are, see what the types of questions are, to see which questions students got wrong. We don't have access to that. So it's hard for us to know how to interpret the data from this particular assessment. My opinion is that it's gonna take many years before we feel like we have a handle on it and it's consistent. Added to which, ninth grade wasn't even complete at the time of administration. So all the other grade levels were adaptive, which means that the assessment changed according to how the students were responding. Ninth grade was not because they hadn't finished designing it until the week that we gave it. None of that's very confidence inspiring, frankly. Um, you know, so we, we tried to take what we could from it, um, looking at trends or general trends. You know, here were pockets of domains that looked a little lower than others. Can we look at that and compare it to our local data and see if we see any alignment? That's about the usefulness of it for us now. Um, it's, it was really challenging. It was quite bad. Julie, so all the principals are right online are here. So Julie texted me and said, do you want to speak to, was it Jake's, Jake's question, Jules? can't see you. Oh, okay, keep going. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was challenging. Great. Um, so these are, this is time for questions for yeah. Mike. Yes. All right, I'm ready. 
Um, and before I do that, I just wanted to make a clarification that um, for the folks who are following along at home, and then also apologies to folks in the room, we don't have paper copies of the full 16-page report. Um, I mean, maybe we could get them if you wanted to see them. But that is some of what Mike was just referencing in his in his presentation, not just the slide. And then that's also a lot of what I have questions about, so it might be a little hard to follow along. Um, I uh, Overall, I... I noticed that we don't have a lot very much in here of an overall for academics. We don't have a lot in here that's like year to year comparisons. Is that just because this some of this data is so new and will we begin to see year to year comparisons and trends? Yeah, most of it is because all of this is new. Yeah, okay. Uh, various aspects of these, but it wasn't, this was the first administration where we were consistent K through uh, 12 in administering these local assessments. Right. So this Except is our, our base. Except for Renaissance Star. Right. Okay. And um, not everybody here knows, but the board just recently named indicators regarding year-to-year -year growth in our priority areas, and one of those is closing the academic gaps. and including to be able to see disaggregated data, and I don't see much disaggregated data in here either for academics. Mm -hmm. Is that also something we could look forward to seeing? We could. We, we just have to pay attention to end size, which is right. a factor, particularly at the elementary level. Right, okay. It prevents us from reporting off quite a bit. Okay. More than the you would other, think. The other question that we would have for the board is, there's lots of assessments here, so which one would you like us to disaggregate? Okay. Statewide testing is probably easiest okay. to do. But not if it's embargoed, though. Not if, once it's not okay. embargoed, yes. Is it because it triggers fewer and says? Yeah, and it's, it's an appropriate measure for the board. It's a general yeah. programmatic measure, so that's yeah. an appropriate measure for the board to see. Okay. And then this might be needed to be state, the state testing as well, but maybe it could also be in Renstar, I don't know. Um, the way that we articulated the indicators was for literacy to see a 5% growth year to year, and then for math to see a 10% growth year to year. Is that something that you could, when in future presentations, show, all right, for this year so far, we've seen a 3% growth, but not yet a 5% growth? I'm just trying to match up what we're saying our goals are with what we're seeing as far as what our current reality is. It, that's a tricky one for me, and that's what I was mentioning, that we're actively trying to figure out how to do that. Okay. But it is tricky. What, what defines growth? You know, how do, how do we identify growth? Is it cohort to cohort um, comparison? Is it on Renaissance Star? Or is it on the VT cap? Or is it a combo of the two in which we have to create some sort of formula to figure that out? Okay. That's where I need um, Julie's beautiful mind to help figure out where we can do that. And also, to be honest, to do it in a way that's efficient for us to be able to provide it. Right. You know, um, like for example, providing, you know, one of the things that Libby spoke to is the state assessment it might be an easier one to show by demographic. Part of that is because the data comes back to us already sorted that way. Whereas with local assessments, we'd have to do that by hand and create some sort of structure to be able to do that. So I think, um, I think we need a little bit more time. The goal is to be able to do that, okay. for, for sure. We just need a little bit more time figuring out how to do that well and sustainably okay. and accurately. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I also want to remind the bar for uh, Renaissance Star, the analogy or metaphor I've been using lately is that it's like the when the school nurse gives the eye exam at school, right? Mm -hmm. The eye screener, that she she doesn't immediately if Jake fails it give him glasses. She sends him to a doctor to get more mm -hmm. diagnostics, right? So that's the level of, of the run star. It's way big and broad, and, mm -hmm. and so that number is why that or that idea of what a, what a screener is meant for is not to show anything. What doesn't compare it between cohorts and all that kind of stuff because it's so big and broad. It's okay. meant to say, hey, this kid needs more. We need to look at this kid closer through other diagnostics. Yeah. Okay. I remember the screening for lice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with that. Yeah. I think eyes. Yeah, I think eyes. <laughs> <I think I, laughs> <but. laughs> we actually don't do that screening. Oh, really? Yeah. So and then I have I'm curious about a few of the specific things. Um, there 
and then numbers at Roxbury Village School on proficiency for reading and math, and maybe this is because it's so big and broad, are not great. Can you speak to why? Can you tell me which part yeah. you're looking at? Let me. I think I am looking at Renstar. Is it the early literacy assessment or the other? No, the, the reading. So I, th I think, you know, there's a, there's a couple things here. One is that the, the population is significantly less, so one student's score makes a bigger percentage swing on this assessment um, for this. Keeping in mind that for um, kindergarten and first grade didn't take it in the fall, first grade took the early literacy, mm -hmm. so they're not counted in the reading assessment. So it's really second, third, and fourth, and that's very few students that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a contributing factor. Okay. But I know that Shannon and um, her team have been really working on uh, focus on literacy, along with all the work that we're doing as a district to be able to work on that. So mm -hmm. we're doing we're doing the work. And also in the sorry, in, in the foundational I mean, other I saw a lot of like kind of abysmal scores. I think you might have answered this are where it's broken down to skills and is that cause for alarm or is that just the you know averages were were not taught in fifth grade by the time at the time the test was taken. Yeah so um, we reviewed these uh, and Julie can pop in here too I think but we reviewed these with Amy Kimball who's one of our amazing uh, instructional coaches and there weren't any real surprises to us in terms of this, but what did come out, you know, I think an actionable thing that we saw from this were some vertical alignment components that we want to consider a little bit more. So this was the first year that we did the ninth grade um, foundational skills assessment because we wanted to see that, that transition from eighth to ninth grade and see what was happening there. So we immediately saw some things in there about prime factorization that I can't tell you anything about. Um, but that, that there was this disconnect that we need to really go back and take a look at what are we doing in eighth grade and to ninth grade to be able to do that. And we were able to see that from this, this quick assessment. Um, but there was nothing on here that didn't really align with our order of introduction of skills or strategies. It was all kind of where we expected to see students. The real power in the foundational skills assessment is that when a, a classroom teacher gets the list of all their students, they can look across at an individual student and see which skills that student is lower in or higher in and be able to really programmatically think about how to support that student or group of students. And then they can also look down the skill column and see where their class as a whole is in that, that experience. And so we do have some teachers that give foundational skills a couple times, like just to get that constant check-in about where their kids are and be able to respond to that. At a minimum, we're doing it three times a year to be able to do that. So we're coming up on our winter administration in about two weeks after the break, and we're really excited to see where students have come from this fall uh, data that you're seeing right now to the winter. We're expecting some big, big bumps. So the kids will take the same, the same assessment in, right. in winter. So this really is a, it's a pretest for the year. Okay, yep. so, so in some ways, you should be thinking about this data not as, oh my God, 7% of our people yeah. don't know something they should know, but this is, yeah, so obviously. 7% yeah. of our people know something they haven't been taught yet. No, exactly. Yeah. Know something they haven't been taught yet, and it also gives an indication to the teachers like where individuals are in terms of their work. So Julie's on her phone, and she texted yes. me. We have created SST groups, so that student support team groups to provide interventions for skills we would expect them to already have, um, like multiplication in grade seven, yeah. and pre-teaching for the upcoming units. So where something is particularly low, the teachers can use it to pre-teach in a small group setting okay. to be more prepared for the unit that comes ahead, which is, an, which is another way you can intervene in our, in our MTSS model. Perfect. All right, um, that is helpful. Right. I just had a couple more oh, questions on the academics. Um, the spring 2023 and fall 2023 on early literacy mm -hmm. had a big difference. Is that simply because in fall 2023 those are different students than they were in spring 2023? So the early literacy assessment is, is kind of a tricky thing. I think when people think of the word early, they think young. 
it's early in their literacy development. So we use that assessment across K through 12 for certain students, depending on where they are in their literacy experience. So it's a tricky one to report out on for that reason. Largely, kindergarten, first grade do take that assessment, but we have approximately 12 to 15 students all the way up to 12th grade that take this assessment. Mm. And so it's never the same students from year to year. It's, it's, not, it's not quite the same thing. Should we be alarmed that it went from 64% to 45%? I think that that shows that we've got some kids that have some needs this year yeah. in the early end. However, it's not unusual for us to see a, a lower score in the early literacy in the fall yeah. and then jump right up, okay. particularly for those kindergarten students and those first graders. Yeah. That is not unusual. That would make sense to me. I mean, if you think about a five-year-old in October, right. they've been in school for four weeks. Right. Yep, sure. That's what I was thinking. I just I appreciate the clarification. Yep. It's a tricky one to, to use as a reporting measure. And then I just have one more, which I, I'm guessing is along these same lines, which was the um, kindergarten... Um, interpretation um, that it was on math. Sorry, I need to find it in the actual. Oh, here we go. No. Oh, kindergarten, uh, kindergarten forward counting to 100, I think. Mm -hmm. where the mean had got 0.67 rather than what we looked for was somewhere between 7 and 8. Yep. Is that because it's early, these are incoming kindergartners, they just don't know it yet, yep. we're going to start teaching it. Yep. Yeah. You haven't seen anything like assessing kindergartner in the first week of school. <laughs> <laughs> it's really magical. Um, but we have uh, our K team, uh, K teams are, are amazing. And our interventionists that support those teams are incredible, and they're feeling extremely confident already with the, the progress in students in kindergarten. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for yeah. sharing all this data and for also walking me through understanding it. Appreciate it. Brett. I have a question, actually. Um, I'm looking at the Did you have the yes. start. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Brett's been in, in, in line for a while. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. I did. So over the two years that I've been on the board, the most consistent piece of data that I've seen is the gap between RBS and UES. And I'm wondering if you feel like there's any gains being made there. If not, why not? It's complicated. If it's complicated, why, how? And following that, when we're talking about statistics and numbers and one small one score bringing down a larger group, what happens when these kids get to MSMS? Does it just get dissolved, or is it tracked? Is does it continue to be sort of tracked, or um, you know? Because I wonder about Roxbury kids that you know expressed an achievement gap from Union kids when they were at the elementary school level. Then they get to the middle school level. And is there a way to sort of see whether or not there's essentially a like a statistical jump? Because, I don't know, there's more resources, there's more teachers, there's more specialists, there's more, you know, the, 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 the idea that union has more um, would mean greater success for elementary school kids from Roxbury is floated regularly. And is there data to support that from the middle school? I can say that if a student, it doesn't matter which elementary school they come from, if a student enters Main Street Middle School and their assessments show that there's needs that need to be met, then they go straight into our remediation and our intervention. That's the model we have, right? Um, I think Shannon can speak to what's happening now at RVS because there are definitive needs here that are um, pretty large and there's no getting around that. Um, so Shannon, do you want to speak to this though? Sure, yeah. Uh, for folks who have an FBI, Shannon Miller, I'm uh, the teaching principal here at Roxbury. So I do administrative work, but I also teach math and literacy three times a day across all five grade levels. Um, so I've met all the kids and I've taught at Union for four years and I can confirm that the kids are the same. So it's no big split in between RVS and UES as far as kids' academic capabilities, their competence, anything like that. Um, it is 
also I would say not the case that UES has more in a sense per child. They ha absolutely have more interventionists, but they have four for 400. We have one for 40. Um, so actually we have more access um, when kids demonstrate a need to be in that kind of service. They're in it really quickly here. Um, I absolutely think that there have been some concerns in terms of consistency and curriculum here. Um, that's my passion. That's why I applied for this job and I'm super psyched to be working on it with everybody all the time. So we are all hands on deck for 30 minutes a day in our SST or WIN groups. Um, I assess most kids every three to four weeks to find out how they're progressing. They know what their goals are, they get immediate feedback, and they move into new goals. Um, our focus is literacy right now because um, if you have weak literacy skills, that impacts your ability to access every other part of the curriculum, right? So that's our goal right now. Kids are making awesome progress. Um, we've also done some work in breaking apart those multi-age classrooms. For example, I teach fourth grade math now, so third and fourth aren't together. So all grade levels are getting a full 60 minutes of instruction. Same thing in our 1-2 classroom. Our interventionist is able to help with our first grade group. Our, our first and second grade teacher can teach second grade. Kindergarten has its own time. So there's been a lot of places where there have been some quick improvements that have had a big impact right away. Um, so I am really looking forward to seeing this winter data too. Um, just to see how much um, how much has changed, and I just love seeing the cultural shifts around too, um, especially with how much kids are reading, talking about reading, and asking me for flashcards off the bus for multiplication facts. So I think it's been all great changes right away, and these are great kids, and they're showing a lot of progress and a lot of energy around their own improvement. Do you get to sleep? Um, <laughs> I do sleep. I don't know if I do much else right now, but I, I work and I sleep. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? What? Um, I'm looking at the Renaissance Star Early Literacy Assessment and I'm wondering um, um, why the not tested percentages are so high. What, what's going on with that? Because that's the percentage of the total population. Of so the school, not the, school. not the group that gets tested. That's right. Okay. Yep. Yep. So only 29% of the school was took the early, in or that, in the spring, took yeah, the early okay, got it. So, yeah. And why, why is that? It's designed for students that are at a lower literacy level. So if you're above a certain point and you take a regular reading assessment. And that data is below in the Renaissance Star reading assessment. That's right. That's I have a similar experience. <clears throat> um, actually, first of all, I want to go back and just say I love the assessment page. I really appreciate the assessment page, and I feel like you told us last year that you were going to kind of make this information available to families and kind of a clear and, you know, I mean, digestible way to some of us more like education nerd types, but it's super appreciated, and it's a great resource to be able to share with folks when you're like, is your kid doing what they should be doing at this point in their education? So I feel like it's, it's just, I really am grateful for that. Um, I had a similar experience to Mia in that some of the RBS data when it comes to the Star assessment is pretty glaring and it feels like, whoa, you know, 78% not being proficient. And I think, you know, if you look at spring to fall, it's like less, I think once we hit more than half are proficient, you know, in one particular area. So it's, it's alarming, it's glaring, it's also just Star, which what I'm hearing, like, that's one snapshot, it's one tool. Um, however, when I see things like 78% not proficient, and then I see things like we've had a really significant increase in the RFL percentages. I'm thinking about like Title I funding, like does that kind of bump us up to get any, no, any additional kind of federal funding to do that? Being a little bit familiar with, you know, Title I and that we can get more tutoring and there's kind of more family outreach. Mike is giving me a hard shaking head no. Um, okay, so that's kind of what I was curious, if any of those numbers kind of in combination could kick in some more funding to no, put those um, supports in place. This isn't a people problem. This isn't a yeah. throw more people at the problem. Yeah. This is get better at what we do. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Um, that's not Staff, right. interventionists, yeah. yeah, systems. Systems, yes. Yeah, okay, thank uh, you. Just just to see the Title I thing, that, that was, I think, everybody's understanding of how Title I works. Yeah. It's actually not as connected to free and reduced lunch as even I thought <coughs> until recently that the AOE huh. has kind of educated us on how that actually works. And um, Our Title I funds are based on census information, not free and reduced lunch. Uh -huh. um, but it's how 
the free and reduced lunch connection is that that's, that's a demographic that they want data back on. Yeah. If you'd asked me that last year, I would say, oh, yeah, if F FRL, it runs our title one, that's how. It, yeah. Uh, so yes. it's new learning for me. Yeah, okay. Um, but it doesn't come with any additional um, funding or anything like that. But the other thing I would say is just to, to highlight the work that we are doing. So we have yeah. Shannon, who's an instructional leader, out here doing that work. The Roxbury staff and the UES staff is engaged in year one of letters training, which is very intensive around literacy instruction. Um, we have new resources for literacy instruction across the district. We have all of these things that are happening mm -hmm. across both schools, and, and, and it's, it's the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So. And so like when our teachers are in these teacher training programs, like does that mean they're implementing this year or is they're kind of getting their chops, you know, developed and they'll bring it in at the end of this year or next year or is like it's all kind of happening at once? Like it's all kind of happening at once. Designing, building, flying, playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. I was in a kindergarten classroom a couple weeks ago with Katie and we were watching a masterful kindergarten teacher work with new learning from the letters training and she's she's talking she's like okay i'm figuring this out too like she's she's just playing around with the ideas and um working through a different way of teaching the kids and she was very upfront with them about like i'm learning how to do this so let's do it together it was, yeah. super, it was awesome it was goosebump for me cool great yeah i would yeah. add to that too that these are curriculums that we already the district has bought and they're in place and people are using them as far as foundations and Hegarty letters is sort of the background on how to implement that well. So mm -hmm. it's like a backup. Mm -hmm. I can extend now, I can explain this better, but it's not like a brand new thing I'm gonna to take to my class tomorrow. We're already teaching it. This is just how to teach it better and with more background knowledge. Great. My other question was how are we leveraging our new teaching principal position? <laughs> and here that, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Um, I really appreciate this data presentation, Mike, and I know that I've, I've sat through, this is the third one now, I think, that I've sat through, and um, and they're getting better every year and stronger every year, and I was wondering if just for the audience's sake, if you might be able to, you or maybe Libby, just give like maybe like a one minute or two minute sort of overview of from year to year, like since you've started as superintendent, how has this improved? Because I've seen it. I don't know if I can like speak articulately about it tonight. <laughs> Just wondering if you can sort of keep your own comment on it. So when Mike and I started, um, there were assessments that were given. Nothing was formalized. So nothing was written on paper to say, this is the window, you're going to do it now. Um, the scores were kept in random Google Docs. So only certain people had access to it. Mike and I were not those people. Um, so we couldn't easily put, put our fingers on data uh, and how we were doing. Um, we had no social emotional learning data. We didn't know our special education data. We certainly didn't know our chronic absenteeism data. Um, now I could look at Petra and tell you, I could pull her up on Panorama, tell you the day she was absent. So the days she was absent, she's not absent very much, I looked. So the <laughs> day she was absent, I could tell you her rent star scores, I could tell you her cognitive score, all in one page. I can see that about a student at the tip of my fingers mm -hmm. now. Um, and when we started, more importantly, I think, is that our teachers weren't using the data as a group, as a collaborative group. Mm -hmm. So we, there wasn't a conversation around, this is what our group of second graders are doing right now. Um, and we need to get them here. Like we didn't have any kind of priority standard um, for all kids to be <coughs> We didn't have our universal skills named. So um, if Jim was the loudest teacher in the bunch to say Jess needs work, then Jess got work whether or not she had, we had data to show that or not. Right. Um, and now our interventionists are working really in a remedial capacity based on universal skills. So it's night and day from what we used to be doing. And yeah. this year is the first year I think our flywheel is starting to turn a little faster in some areas. Um, and we just we're trying to celebrate the, the Jesus out of our teachers because they're, it's significant paradigm change for our teachers in some areas. So um, they're, they're working hard at it. And it's tough. That kind of change is very hard on a professional. So 
um, we're really impressed with the work that's happening right now. And like Mike and I were talking, we went to a conference last week and we were talking that we're super excited. It, the conference was really yeah. reassuring and our team learned a lot about what are our next steps. Yeah. So it's, we're excited to see where we go. Well, I can see that growth because I've been on the board now for three and a half years and I can see it and it's palpable and it feels great to see this version of a data presentation versus what we were seeing. We couldn't give you one when I first yeah. started. Yeah, and even last year's was rocky. <laughs> um, but I just want to kind of like raise the roof for you guys and thank you so much for um, improving the systems and the data so much over the last three years. It's, it's really impressive. And I think we're all still, like in the way Mike is talking about the data, we're all still admitting that this is not, what you're seeing tonight isn't perfect still. And, and there's a room for a lot of improvement still, but I think you've been swimming upstream to like basically create new systems for managing data. And then also on top of a global pandemic and a huge flood in our community. So there's been a lot of factors at play. Um, remind people again when Mike was like the principal of Main Street Middle School, I think, because he could not do the work that he was hired to do. So it's just incredible the strides that have happened, and I just want to give a shout out for that. Um, I have some questions that I wanted you to speak to the percentages of kids, so kind of like Lynn's, but to the other ones, um, so not the early literacy one, but like when I'm looking at the Renaissance Star Reading and the Renaissance Star Math, I'm seeing a pretty broad spectrum of like, sometimes it's 96% um, percent of kids are tested and sometimes it's only 46. Can you just speak to that? Sure, so it's the same with the early literacy. So the students that take the early literacy don't take the reading. So mm -hmm. the, especially in those elementary, that the, the percentage that's represented and not tested is likely students that took the early literacy. Mm -hmm. Our kindergarten students don't take Renaissance Star in the fall, so that percentage includes them of not testing um, in the reading and the math. They take it for the first time in the winter. So that's why like the elementary level is lower than like the middle school level is very high. Shout out to Julie. It's extremely high. Yeah. They uh yes. And um, to point out, our participation at the high school increased significantly from last year to this year as well. So Jason's put in a lot of systems to um, encourage students to, to engage in that assessment um, in a pretty serious way. So we've... We still have a few escape artists. We do. Like stars we do. Yeah, so like high school, the MHS participation was one of the ones that I highlighted. So it, it went from 46% in spring 2023 to 86% in the fall. Yep. Remember that once, Jason, do you want to speak to that? Sure, just remember that as the student ages through and they get to that proficiency level, we don't require them to continue to take it. Mm. So right. wouldn't it be flipped then where you would have more people taking it in spring? No, spring, fall. 20, but it's spring 2023. So we're oh, I see. Okay. I had that same thing when I first okay. that too. Yeah. I'm doing the switching up there. Yeah. Because it's listed first also, but okay, gotcha. Um, Thank you. Uh, the I'm wondering, so is STAR only taken two times a year? No, three times. Three times a year. And what you said uh, in the first week of school, and then is it just sort of broken up from there? Uh, the first assessment period is in uh, mid-September. The second, the winter is uh, December 6th through the 21st. And then um, the spring, maybe yeah, the spring is. And, and is there any reason why it's like not given more often? Like is more data better or not in this, for this specific test? Renaissance Star? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's designed to be given any more often than that um, intentionally. Um, we certainly, I don't feel like we need Renaissance Star more than three times a year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, Partly because we're doing such a good job with the diagnostic assessments that we really know the targeted skills that students need. I think the, the diagnostics, the common formative and common summatives at uh, grade levels are much more important, and we're doing those often. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's informing instruction and learning. Um, and then the, the Renaissance Star really either confirms information for us or gives us a little flag that we need to look closer at, at some other area. So three times a year seems to work really well. And for the common formative and common summative assessments, just for people who may not know that language, 
it's like every kid in sixth grade is going to get like a similar or the, maybe the exact same, let's say, multiplication formative assessment, like a little quiz or something yeah. in class. Based on our priority standards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, with the, in terms of like Mia's question about disaggregating data or reporting out based on um, the values that the board has put forward and the goals, would there be able to be like just a district-wide report on the achievement gap that isn't broken down by school? Would that be possible? Probably. It would depend on how uh, depend on how we define that. How we define what? The achievement gap. Okay. So one of the things that we're wrestling with with that goal is what assessment are we judging this on? Mm -hmm. Right. It, and that's a question we have. Right. Mm -hmm. So it makes most sense from our team's perspective, because we've talked about it quite a bit, that the VCAP, when we get it, is the board level, you know, because it's large, it's programmatic, it's all state kind of wide. Um, that's what we should be looking at as like our achievement gap score. Um, because if you, you can't necessarily do that for the other assessments. They're not right. meant to, be to, to do that. It also sounds like these ones are in their infancy and maybe not that reliable. Well, they're, re they're reliable. The math, the math is a student, a teacher grown one, which has some, may have some reliabilities, but the words their way in the um, RENSTAR and national assessments, I've, I've been given words their way since I started teaching a long time ago. You know, so um, those, but those are more for teachers to, Im to immediately right. use in their practice, not to judge program. Mm -hmm. Right? So the, the question for the board around achievement gap is are, are programs working, right. programs, right? right, working to achieve the level we want to achieve? Across the board, regardless exactly. of the demographic. And, the, and the, the assessment for that is the, is the state assessment. And like star assessment would literally probably be going by student by student and sort of like pulling them out and putting them into aggregated, disaggregated categories. Yeah. Like, because the data isn't attached to the star, mm -hmm. right? Or is it attached in, um, I'm forgetting the software that you said you could Panorama. Play. Panorama. 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 We can probably do it in Panorama. Nick and Mike are my <clears> Panorama <throat> guys. But just keep in mind what the star tells us. The star tells us you need more diagnostics, right? The star tells us that you've got some, blo some blurries in your eyes from the eye test. Yeah. It doesn't tell us what it is, right? It doesn't, like, point exactly to, like immediately say Jake needs to work on this piece of word recognition. Right? That's a that's right. diagnostic. And does. do you feel like the VT cap does that? It breaks it down into concepts and themes. And it still might only be like one question for no, I think it's more than that. there are many it's more, more than, than that. that. Yeah. And the star the Renaissance star does break things into concepts and themes. They just may or may not be tied to our, our stand the statewide standards. Yeah. Right? The the V cap is written on our statewide standards. Right, so there's several. Which is what we based our priority standards on, right? Exactly. Okay. So there are several connections there that. I think it makes total sense too. I'm I'm just nervous about the whole like embargo, like secretive data. That's the problem. That's the and problem. so like if we can't ever see it, then can we, <laughs> in the meantime, come up with a with another way of at least you know sort of in the way that we're doing here, where it's imperfect, but we're getting a few different um, data sets and we're able to at least get some thing <laughs> to yeah. report out on. So it might, I don't know what your estimate is on when we would, have, when the general population would have access to it's that It's not data. my estimate, it's AOE's, <laughs> I have nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, it's totally the Agency of Education. We, they promised us it when we first started the VCAP that we'd have it in two weeks after assessment. Yeah. Right. That's so true. like, we did not have it two weeks after the assessment. I'll tell you that. You know, so, and, and even now, we sent home individual scores. Y'all got one if you have a third yep. grader through a ninth grader. And we, and on that has our district scores. <laughs> and so right. we can't. And I didn't get any cover letters saying I could not speak about that. Right. Publicly, <laughs> right. Which I will say the district's doing really good <laughs> compared to, right. it didn't compare to the, it was only compared to the rest of the state. Yeah. But we were doing really good. Just a, just a quick add-on to the VT cap, um, speaking to Jim's question about the validity of the assessment. I mm -hmm. think it's okay to, we put this on our website too as an update. We got the results. We were told, print up the reports and send them home. We printed up all the reports and just before we put them in the mail, they said, don't, the data's wrong. 
<laughs> so, okay. so we had to wait another week and a half, do it again. And those are the types of experiences that make us really question. So this is what I'm talking about, swimming upstream and just appreciating the efforts <laughs> that are being made. And then just wondering, like, for the sake of, um, you know, being practical about it, if there's any way that we can, like, provide something in the interim. Mm -hmm. um, Libby, you spoke a little bit about, like, it sounds like you might have school-level data teams. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Can I just do just a quick, we're at 810, Mike's gone, we've got three more presentations. Um, I don't want to shortcut the discussion about data, but I, I do want to make sure that we um, get to all the presentations while we still have the energy to ask and more questions. I'm going to touch on that in a little bit, and then we can do a bigger presentation about our collaborative teams because okay. it's something we're super proud of too. So I do think just for future reference, like this data presentation is always like a huge uh, time commitment in our meetings. And I, I do always feel a little rushed through it, and I think, so I just think maybe we break it up into like, and have people come at, on different nights yeah. for the future. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's a good suggestion. Um, and I, I don't want to like talk, I just want, because it's easy to just keep asking questions. And... It's fun to grill Mike too, so let's all put uh, that out there. Bye. Thank you, Sue. I'll be great. Thank you, Sue, go for it. Okay. Um, so, um, I just, I have one slide, um, just kind of the overview. One of the things that um, we are still trying to figure out because all of our um, programming is so individualized is how do we measure growth of special education programs as a whole. And um, so that is something we're still working on. Um, looking at the trends, um, as you can see, we have had um, an increase in the number of students that are being found eligible for special education. So last year on November 1st, we were at 125 um, K to 12, and this year we're at 156. So that's pretty significant. Thank goodness we filled all our special educator positions this year, um, because that would be really challenging if we were still down three like we were last year. Um, our percentages of disabilities are, there's not really any significant change, so there's not one particular um, area of disability that we've seen any um, spike in or decrease in, so that's stayed pretty much the same. Um, our uh, evaluations or referrals for initial evaluations for special education are about the same at this time as they were last year. Um, it is a growth from two years ago when um, at, on November 1st there had only been seven requests for new evaluations and last year and this year we are at 21. So there is definitely um, an increase in um, concerns. Most of those uh, requests are coming from families, um, not through the school systems I think because we have so many great systems in place um, that we're supporting students, but um, that is, we are doing a lot of evaluations. And some of those are from students that have moved in from out of state, which we are required to do um, a Vermont evaluation if you move in from out of state with an IEP. Um, but that is, thank goodness we have our new school psychologist. She's amazing and um, we are keeping her busy. Um, thinking about, um, oh, one of the things that I added this year just to have you have an awareness around is the number of students that we have placed by IEP teams in alternative settings. So last year on November 1st, that number was 11. This year it's 14, so that is increasing. Um, and that is the first thing that I put on our, the work that we're continuing to do is really working on our capacity to meet the needs of all students within our schools. So really trying to, um, you know, Jess has done a ton of work this year, which we'll talk about, um, around the social emotional supports for students, um, since that tends to be the primary reason that we end up, um, teams end up needing to look for alternative placements. Um, so hoping that this trend will start to go the other way, um, but we do have a significant number of needs um, for students, which uh, anyone who's done any reading knows with the mental health stuff that's happening for students, we're seeing that in the school. So that's not surprising, but uh, important information. And uh, doing a lot of work with data, as there's been a lot of talk about, and really helping uh, IEP teams use data um, in their decision making. Um, 
there has been significant changes in <clears throat> the way evaluations happen for special education. Um, over the last couple of years, the regulations were changed in Vermont, and there is a significant increase in focusing on data, <coughs> data as opposed to tests. Oops, my computer just shut off. That was a good time. Um, as opposed to test scores. So um, the, all of the work that we're doing throughout our systems is contributing right into us having more impactful um, evaluations. Um, looking to grow, continue to grow our knowledge about the impact of disability on um, students and how it impacts their access to their education, which is what special education is about, um, and uh, continuing to work to build consistent experiences for families across the district. One of the things I did this summer was create a caregiver's handbook around special education because one of the things that um, I've heard from a number of families as I've been doing this for years and I still don't understand what happens in any of these meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, I, there's a handbook on the website that um, I ask people to, to keep electronically because we're adding stuff as questions come in and families are saying things, you know, like, hey, can you help me understand this or whatnot, uh, but hoping that that's a resource that is breaking it down or at least um, giving families a place to look if they have questions or if something isn't making sense. Um, and then just the, our multilingual learners have stayed pretty consistent as far as the percent of the population that we have in the school. So there. No questions? Go on to the next. No, just kidding. <laughs> right. Do, am I correct that students can uh, essentially graduate from their 504 plan when they sort of no longer leave, need that level of support? Is that a so sort of 504 and IEP are two different things. Right. So, um, so 504 is about access and it's about um, removing barriers. So for it to, have, to be protected under 504, you have a disability that is significantly impacting a major life function. For most students in school, that major life function is learning. And so 504 plans are plans of protection to make sure that essentially someone's not discriminated against because of their disability. Um, so those are plans that, um, depending on the setting that you're in, could go into a, it was actually a workplace law to start with. And so um, Section 504 is something that also applies to adults in the workplace. Um, special education is around um, students with disabilities that are significantly impacting that access um, and then they need some kind of specialized instruction that isn't available to all students. So part of what happens is as we continue to build better, or not better, we have amazing systems, but as we build our systems, there are more systems that are going to be available to all students. But to answer your question, yes. Yes. The goal would be, yes, that a student would get to a place where they would no longer need specialized instruction. They still might need accommodations and things like that, but they're not looking at needing modified um, academics, and so they can actually become no longer eligible under special education. In some cases, then they move to protection under Section 504, and in some cases, um, they, they are at a place where they don't need any kind of plan. So, because I was wondering if the modest reduction from November last year to this year indicates like some sort of oh, success. Oh, Yeah. Um, sort of like. My guess, my guess would be it's more around graduation yeah. rates than, yeah. Oh. They're actually, feel, I mean, it actually was surprising to me that there, our number went down because it feels like there's a lot, um, most, mostly at the high school, um, tends to be where, um, and, and some at the middle school, but the, the high school for sure. And a lot of those are around the mental health stuff that students are experiencing. Yeah? Other questions? I got a question. Can I ask it? We usually do not take questions of the audience since we've got um, once public comment is over, but you can certainly email a question to. I don't or, email. You know, you can write it on a piece of paper and. It's just simple. Is there a program for high school to stop the absenteeism? You know, they need to know we're trying to improve your life. Stay in school. 
It's outrageous. It's about the only thing I can understand in this statement. I'd like to have somebody sometime go over it with me so I could understand it all. All the acronyms and stuff. So, I think you already mentioned this, the, um, how possible it is to be able to show us some trends of numbers, percentages, sort of like what Olivia was saying on our academic data, we'd love to be able to see at the board level, are our programs working? What is the thing that indicates to us, are our programs working, or is there more we need to do with our programs to get them to work better? That's a good question. Um, one of the things that we are, we're trying to figure out now that we have Panorama, is there, is there a way for us to be able to pull data that will show us progress for students with IEPs right. without having someone have to go through and handwrite, that kind of stuff. So um, that's some of the stuff that we're still trying to figure out because it really is, it's hard to look at things like exit rates because sometimes kids just move or, right. you know, like there's so many. So um, it, it, it is something that we're still trying to figure out how to do beyond um, an individual basis. Yeah. And um, it actually is something that uh, we had, uh, we sent a number of special educators to conferences recently um, around Solution Tree and that's part of what we're trying to engage them into is like thinking about how do we think about our system of special education and you know how do we know that what we're doing is effective so still trying to figure that out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Is family satisfaction, satisfaction with the services provided a metric that's measured? So um, last, yes. So last year one of the changes that was made with the state regulations for special education is that there is now a family input form that is at the end of an IEP. And so last year, what we um, did is we sent out, actually we created that form also for students with Section 504 plans and asked families to send that in so we could try to get that. We didn't get a ton of response to that. Um, so it really wasn't a high enough number to really give us that. Um, the other way that it comes out is the AOE sends out um, surveys every year to any family of a student with a disability and then they send um, the, the districts the reports and the response rate on that is pretty low as well. Um, and so, and that's across the state. I mean, I will admit as a parent of someone in Essex, I was like, oh, I should probably fill this out. But it's just like one more, one more survey, right? And sometimes people get survey weary. So, um, Yes, there is. There are measures for that, but the response rate has been pretty low. Hi, um, I feel like one of the last times we heard from you, like I think it was like our special ed one on one training, um, was that, and I think this was a priority within the new special education law, but just how kind of special ed strategies were working their way into like tier one instruction. Mm -hmm. Did I dream that, or was that a goal that you guys were? And moving in that direction. It's not that special ed strategies are moving okay. into tier one instruction. It's that in order to qualify for a specific learning disability, yep. a, a collaborative team around a child has to show yep. all the different interventions and remediation strategies okay. that they've tried yep. um, prior to identification. So it's just it's it's not taking special education specialized services and putting yeah, them into the tier one. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. It may, it may be less relevant then, but I guess I was curious, like, how's that going? Um, but you might, you know, if it's specific teachers for specific kids, you may not have an update. So uh, what I can say is that one of the things that the special education um, teachers are focusing on is really trying to, the collaboration that is going so well with the general ed teachers and trying to figure out how to then make sure that that um, special ed and accessibility lens is put into those conversations too because we do need all students accessing that, that first level of instruction. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, cl that collaboration is really one of the key components to making sure that all students are getting what they need um, for that, you know, that instruction that we want all students to have. Right, because a student who's receiving special ed 
services is with maybe their special educator or a certain percentage of the day, and for the rest of the day, they're in their general ed classrooms. So they should so. never be pulled out of their tier one instruction for okay. special education services. Uh -huh. It's supplemental, it yep. is not. Um, and um, what, when possible, we try to have the special educator go in and work with the teacher and get those services actually in the classroom so they're not getting pulled out at all. Okay. There are some services that do happen outside the classroom, and so yep. teams are really thoughtful about when to do that so that they're not missing that tier one instruction because then we're just continuing yeah. a gap by not giving them that access. That's super helpful to paint that picture of what it looks like. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you speak to the, to the increase and then leveling out of the referrals? Um, no, because I wasn't here before. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not really sure. Um, I, it's felt like a lot of referrals in the last couple of years, and I don't know if that's coming out of COVID and parents like spending time with their kids and like, oh, I wonder if this is a thing, you know, because only about half, we did 57, um, I think it was 57 initial evaluations last year, and only about half of them were eligible. So there were a number of um, evaluations that parents requested and that we completed that the student and either didn't have a dis didn't have a disability or for whatever reason was not found eligible. Um, so I think there's some work like it's it's a, a it's a work when people are worried or think there might be something off with their child, which makes sense, right? Then you want all the information you can and so I think that that's where a lot of the um, referrals are coming from. Do you know if the eligibility number has remained fair, more consistent or if there was the same a jump like that for eligibility um, Well, there was a jump between last year and this year, for sure, um, mm -hmm. of the number of students. Um, and I think that we will see um, a, an upward trend because of the way that the regulations were changed. So it used to be prior to July 1, um, there's three gates. And the second gate is that the disability has to have an adverse effect, is what it's called. And it used to be that you, you had to show that a student was in the lowest 15th percentile rank in a basic skill area, and you had to show that at least three different ways, and that now they've taken away that 15th percentile cutoff, and so there's more flexibility, I would say, for teams to talk about impact, and they added functional skills as a basic skill area to look at. So a lot of the um, social-emotional stuff that Jess is going to talk about um, previously wasn't necessarily a basic skill area that then you, if, unless you, it could be an area of need, but if it was the only area of need, then you wouldn't qualify for special education. And now a student could qualify for special education only with functional skill needs without, even if their academics are all right on track. So I think that we're going to continue to see um, an increase in the number of students eligible. Okay. And do you, do you ever compare, is there a way to, or do you compare your data district-wide to other schools or the state? Is there any way to compare? Um, so I was actually showing that to Mike a couple of weeks ago. So the, we do get state information, but it's usually a couple of years behind our current stuff. So it makes it tricky to compare because it's not, you know, I, th I think it's hard to look at stuff COVID and before and COVID after and compare those. Um, I, I'm not sure they're apples to apples. But yeah, the, the federal um, Office of Special Ed Programs will put out state information and the state does too, but it's, it's a couple years behind. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions for pregnancy? Great, I'm not sure. Jess is up. Yeah, I'm next. Up. Yeah, sorry, I was giving you the appropriate amount of wait time of her life. Um, so I have two slides, um, and I'll mostly refer to them. Um, so I, my first slide is really around some of the metrics and data that you all are familiar with from last year. Um, and then the second slide really has to do with the panorama survey, which as Mike has referred to, has really been a game changer in a lot of ways, especially in the SEL world, because instead of just having a bunch of data around how kids are struggling or doing all the things they're not supposed to do, for the first time we have real data that can universally track um, how students are doing in social emotional learning skills and how they really report how they're experiencing school in general. So I'm very excited about that data and the ways that we've been using it. Um, 
But to get us started, our HHB investigations, our hazing, harassment, and bullying um, investigations are down um, when we compare the beginning of the year to this point last year to right now, um, they're down 30%. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with some of the direct teaching that especially our assistant principals have engaged um, students in. Um, and we have been really better able because we have really strong data, now better data around tracking students' SEL skills. We can better predict who will need extra supports in order to proactively prevent and um, support students with those lagging skills and hopefully prevent a lot of those incidents from happening. Happening, um, I think you know our next step in the HHB world is really thinking about how to more um, proactively, really explicitly and directly teach ar around things like learner differences, race, gender, gender identity um, in the classroom across schools so that we can really start building a common language around how we support students and learning that and um, connecting with others across difference. Our rates of incidents are down um, across the district. Um, from last year, specifically at UES and RBS, we're seeing a decrease in the rate of physical aggression when compared to the same time last year. And at MHS, our phone usage is down by 57%. Um, they have a new cell phone policy that has really been successful. And while that maybe doesn't seem particularly notable when we think about the impact that technology and things like social media have on students and student learning, that's huge. Um, we're continuing to see some disproportionate data um, among students who identify as male, um, students who are experiencing or who are qualified for free and reduced lunch um, at UES and MHS, and then students who have a disability are more likely to have a reported behavioral incident at MSMS. Um, you know, I think, again, for the first time we have Real, more specific data around who is accessing tiered SEL instruction because we have gotten to the point where we're now tracking that in progress monitoring students who are receiving tier two and tier three intervention in the SEL world. Um, so I can confidently talk about the numbers and the students who are um, getting that intervention and we have now a framework for how we're gonna track progress for those students over time. Um, one of the ways, sort of our next step in that, is really shifting our tier two and our tier three teams to so the community of SEL providers who supply that tier instruction and really shifting those meetings to be not just about matching students based on their need with the most expert SEL professional to provide that instruction, but also now thinking about how do we share our practice, how do we look at data as a collaborative team, and really learn together to make sure that we know when students are progressing and we can take the next step when students are progressing in the way that we would hope. Um, additionally, our suspension rate is down 85%, which I am very, very excited about. It's a huge, huge change from last year. Just to give folks a framework at the beginning of last year from August to early November, we were on average suspending students um, twice a week, and now it is on average once every two months. Um, I think some of that is around the decreases in behavioral incidents that we're seeing this. I also think it is we've gotten a lot better at having alternative, um, restorative, and therapeutic responses specifically to HHB investigations. Um, as far as some of the panorama data, again, really exciting tool for the first time. We, three times a year, can track um, SEL skills based on our SEL prioritized standards that we have. So we have a way now to screen all of the students um, who come to school at MRPS and can identify students who are struggling in really specific SEL areas. Again, they're directly linked to our SEL prioritized standards. And we have students who are now self-reporting how they experience belonging, relationships, and safety in our buildings. Um, so I feel really, really excited to have this. This is really like our first time using this, so this is very much baseline data. I'm really excited about what that growth trajectory will look like um, because, again, we're doing it three times a year. So as Mike said, we're about to do our December 
assessment. Um, and so I'm really looking at like the delta and how that's gonna shift um, and really thinking about that. Some of the work, Nick and I have done a lot of work specifically around belonging and supporting teams of teachers and analyzing it. So we've been to every single team of teachers or have done some full group presentations around what this sense of belonging means, how students are reporting it. Um, I also just yesterday was lucky enough to sit in for a few hours with the MSMS Up for Learning crew and look at some of this data specifically around MSMS and break it down um, by question to really work with students around, so what are we gonna do about this data now that we have it? Um, well, just as the Up for Learning crew, she means kids. Oh. She was yeah, thank kids, you. not adults talking about the data. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the other things that we have been able to do really well this year um, is really embedding restorative practices across the tier. You know, I have examples of a high school teacher who's been able to stop class in order to help re-regulate um, and check in with students um, in ways that hasn't been happening in the past. We had an example um, after an HHB incident actually of um, one of our SEL providers who pushed into a class to do really intentional um, work in a circle around neurodiversity um, and folks on the spectrum and how, you know, the, the support that they need and just um, how to interact again with people across um, learning differences. Um, sorry, just making sure I'm getting you know, all the things. Um, I think that another sort of win this year is all of our teacher teams have designated time to look at this data, analyze it on a very regular basis, um, and think about what are the next steps so they can have really targeted next steps, both <coughs> whole class and also can use this data um, for those tiered instructions, both small group and one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we also have started to really intentionally create training opportunities for instructional assistants <coughs> based on um, you know, disability, learner differences, behavior, equity. So that's kind of work that I've been really, really excited about. Um, and you know, as instructional assistants, they are very much a primary person in a lot of young people's lives, particularly young people who are often the most vulnerable. Um, so I've been really excited about the work that we've done for instructional assistants. Sorry, I feel like I rattled that off for you all, so. And I'm just going back to Emma's question around like six years ago, there, there was nothing, nothing, nothing in place like this. So I get, I get just watch this and we adjust. Yeah. Question, questions, yeah, that was, that was excellent. Um, and now that you've absolutely right, the, the increase, as is Emma, the increase in data we've had over the last several years has been astounding and it keeps getting better and more comprehensive and more better. I just want to observe that I hope that you don't succeed yourself out of our needing you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's possible. No. Good, I yeah, that's yeah. I think young people have a lot to learn. <laughs> Some of us old people do. <laughs> Sure. I just have a real quick question. Um, looking at the MHS incidents, um, when when Emma and I were talking with the students, vaping came up a lot, and I've heard that sort of anecdotally at different, you know, the career center and at the high school, and it's not listed as one of the like more common incidents. Is it is it getting better? Like cell phone use is getting better, or is it categorized differently? Maybe maybe it's under class cut. Or you want to give Jason a shout at that? Yeah, I mean we it would show up in our behavioral data and that okay. would be like a substance use thing. Okay. Um, and I haven't anecdotally heard it as well. Yeah, I think what's really hard about tracking baby versus cell phones is that you have to be physically present, Jill, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to be in the bathroom, so to speak because that's where it's going to happen most. Um, and so while we have adults going in and out of the bathrooms, that's the place it's going to happen and we need to catch people. Um, and it's kind of hard. It's not as easy as it sounds. Um, I, you know, we prefer not to automatically suspend, right? That's, it's a substance issue it's, it's a, right, versus a behavioral issue um, as well. Yeah. But, you know, there's some really nice... Um, Vape detectors. That's what the student was advocating. Right. Have you seen him looking at me? He's going to miss so much of our money. He's waiting for the jewel settlement to come. Oh. Still waiting for that. Still waiting. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. 
I wanted to also offer another piece of historical context. Um, Emma and I served on the subcommittee a few years ago of the school safety um, sub subcommittee, and one of the things that was a really big focus that came up out of the different surveys that we did and the work that we did was the need for more restorative practices. And I can remember um, when we were having those conversations with different folks in the schools, there was sort of like, well, we're just sort of like getting started. And I can see from, that was, that's almost three years ago now, the progress that we've made. It's, it's even clear in the data that, you know, fewer suspensions is a positive, a direct result of, of a greater holistic approach um, around restorative practices, both on the proactive end to build those relationships in the first place, and then pushing in to do a restorative circle when when need be. So I just wanted to highlight that and just really celebrate it because mm -hmm. it's a shift. It's, it's a shift that was in, intended three years ago and that had, we've continued to put in the work, and that is huge. It's huge. Yeah. Okay. Do we know if uh, the restorative practices um, are correcting the behavior? Like, are they just swapping out for suspensions or are they actually serving the purpose? I mean, we're seeing, yeah, that was a question that I looked into too, um, but we're seeing a decrease in the amount of HHP investigations and also the amount of physical aggression, um, which is really where we did a lot of restorative work last year. Um, a lot of my life last year, as Libby knows, was responding to incidents instead of being able to be as proactive as I ha would have liked to have been. Um, so I'm excited I'm getting into that realm very much this year. Um, but I, I would say that the data suggests that we're seeing a decrease, and I would personally like that based on my, my experience and viewing this work all day, every day, um, is related to restorative practices and also our ability to use data and leverage it in a way we haven't before to meet kids and really hone in on what is the SEL skill that's lacking here that's leading to either the HHP violation or the physical aggression or whatever other behavior is happening. So I think it's probably both. Um, and saying that also feels a little hard and inauthentic just because the act of engaging in a restorative circle is working on SEL skills as well. So that in and of itself can be an SEL intervention. I would just also add a third component in that we've added significant staff to our social emotional learnings group. Um, so Main Street and UES have uh, SEL coach, Main Street and UES, and, and the UES coach comes out here to Roxbury too. Um, and the, we have the SEL teacher to really target specialized skill instruction for students who have IEP goals that are around um, mental health and SEL. Our social workers are working more targeted, targetedly in the remediation world. Our counselors are working more in the tier one, tier two. Like So roles are being defined and the people that the board and the community have added through our budgetary process um, have they're, they're doing the work, right? Like it's, the system is now able to function in a smooth way. In addition to our, our IAs switching to the categories that we did last year and giving them more professional development in this world is like all of these things are working so beautifully together. It's like a different world this year than last year. Yeah, yeah, I would say IA training um, and those categories has been helpful in that. I've been able to really target the crew of humans that are um, the behavioral techs, the people who are working specifically with students with higher behavioral needs, to provide regular ongoing training with myself, um, with other SEO professionals, and with our behavioral specialists in ways that just wasn't happening. Um, and yeah, I think we've done a really, you know, that the role shift I think has been hard and will continue to be hard um, and is working, right? I was able to sit with the UES tier three team um, and we talked through a student who's on an IP who, you know, comes with a lot of stuff to her school every day. Um, and we were able to really skillfully see, like, oh, you take this part, you take this part, you take this part. And it was just this, like, beautiful conversation that I kind of wanted to record, but obviously they couldn't. Um, to really, it was just this feeling of, like, really wrapping the student to make sure that he mm -hmm. is feeling successful. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to call it myself and then, then you may. Um, I want. <laughs> Uh, one thing I'd, I'd um, kind of both an observation and a question. Uh, 
like clearly COVID was very disruptive. I mean, one of the things we noticed was disruptive to behavior. You know, kids just were not with each other the way they were used to at, at a time when a lot of social learning takes place. We know that there was kind of a lot of acting out and just kind of behavioral social skills that, that were not learned. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of great work going on, but is some of this great work also being complemented by those skills are starting to come in place? Kids are getting more used to each other, be together, and you're, you know, giving them kind of the tools to, to reintegrate. Are we starting to see some of the deficits socially and, and kind of emotionally that happened during COVID maybe be made up? Is, is there any of that in that or not? Our principal's take on that. Jason and Shannon, since you two are the two in the room, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think both socially, emotionally, and academically we're seeing that, right? So as students are going through their K-12 years, we're getting more and more intervention, whether it's in how to learn, and how to behave, and, and progress, right? And at the same time, we've learned through COVID the intervention measures that we're dedicated to to keep, as Lily used, the flywheel. Is that what you called it, Lily? Mm -hmm. And then it's spinning faster now. And so we've caught up to, to those pieces. Um, and I think it's naturally supposed to even out, right? And then should get smaller and smaller as time goes by. Um, I think so. And I think at the elementary level, it's been really interesting to see because we're the first ones to see the bubble pass, right? With kids that didn't experience that and you would think some things would go away, um, but they haven't in terms of who needs help understanding how to play games together, um, what social boundaries look like. Um, so even at the earliest of educational settings, I think we're seeing that some things were missed that we really have to pick up the slack on in elementary school. Um, are there still academic <coughs> concerns? Yep, but I think at this point it's so integrated into our work that it's not an extra thing anymore. It just is the work. Yeah. Jess, I had just a couple of questions. Uh, looking at the second slide of yours, there's a pretty big difference in the sense of belonging um, for the, at the third and fourth grade level between RVS and UES. Do you have a, a thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'd be curious to um, have Shannon's perspective on this too. Um, I think some of what Shannon's work has done um, is she's been able to embed um, some, there, it's not just a behavior response, but PBIS, positive um, behavior intervention and supports, which is really the mantra around that and the philosophy around that is we have a common language for how we talk about behavior, how we talk about being community, um, and how we specifically teach young people how to be in community with one another. Um, and I think that that is work that has been really, really well developed historically at UES. Quite frankly, I like inherited a lot of that work. Um, Linda Bopri has been running that for a long time. Um, and that's not work that has historically had the same foundation at Roxbury. I see. Um, and Shannon's working on that, and I don't know, Shannon, your perspective on that as well. Yeah, yeah I would just add, um, so for us, this is one classroom. <laughs> um, and I would also, one thing we talked about when we looked at this data was that these kids have a brand new teacher that they've never met. This was taken in the first two weeks of school. A brand new principal, a brand new music teacher. <laughs> so there was a lot of brand new year, brand new people. Um, that certainly went into this, but it's something that we said, hey, we want to keep a close eye on this. When we come back in December, we shouldn't feel so new anymore, so that really shouldn't be a question. So if those numbers still looked the same, I would have more questions, but I think at that time it made sense that we were looking at a total of 17 children with brand new teachers and principals. And then my, my one other question is that, and you, you spoke to this, Jess, that there are some... Um, uh, discrepancies based on demographics in the behavior um, column, now I'm looking more at the report, um, largely um, kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch and kids on IEPs and kids, um, and I think male students. And I'm curious to know what your analysis is um, about that difference between the percentages of those kids who are identified with behavior issues and um, compared to the, the population overall? Yeah, I mean, I, I have done a lot of thinking around this just because, like, obviously I care about this. Um, 
And what's notable to me is it shifts based on school um, and doesn't always match sort of what we would expect given like national or even Vermont trends, right? So, you know, again, this is just sort of me using my expert brain here. I think when we think about um, students who identify as male versus students who identify or we perceive as female, um, there's a lot in our society that really talks and trains women from a very young age to be compliant and act a certain way. Um, and there is more um, pressure on people who are identifying or perceived as young men to hide in emotions and they tend to be a little bit more of externalizers. So they tend to be a little bit more outwardly obvious behaviors rather than the internalizers um, as women or people who are perceived as women or identify as women um, grow. Um, I don't know if that sort of starts to answer your question. As far as free and reduce lunch, um, I think there are a lot of stressors on students who qualify for a free and reduced lunch um, that makes it really hard for them to always be able to prioritize school and can then make it really hard to feel a strong sense of community and belonging at school, um, which can, may result in behaviors. Nick, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it's reflected in attendance as well, but um, you know, young people facing certain barriers outside of school it's obviously going to have an impact on their ability to be present, ready for school, um, when they're worried about, for some young people, where they're going to sleep tonight. Um, that's going to take priority then, emotional regulation in a certain moment. Yeah, and then as far as disability, um, I sort of see it as like three different reasons. One, they have an identified disability around a particular lagging skill, right? So that would make sense that they would be overly identified. Um, I also think that it is, and probably across these spectrums, uh, another sign to us that we continue to have work to do around making our systems fully inclusive and accessible to all students because we're not yet seeing them able to access in that same way, which is then resulting in behavior. Um, and I think for students with disabilities, there's also a tendency to be hyper vigilant at times. You know, these are students who may be assigned an extra adult, um, who have an extra adult like either right beside them or in their classroom. So we tend to notice behaviors um, that maybe go under under the radar a little bit more for other students or who wouldn't be reported for other students because of particularly if a student has a disability that's resulting in behaviors, we're taking very, very regular, like 15 minute increment, incremental behavioral data at some, at some for some students. Um, so we sometimes just have more data for students with higher behavioral needs. Um, I'm wondering about, so the survey that was used for the belonging, is that on your website somewhere? That we like a viewable version of it that we could see. It's not. Is that something that could be? Is there any no, reason? No, we'd have to talk about that because what we wouldn't want is to have Kristen go home and drill her kid of you <laughs> answer it this way, <laughs> you know. So we get up from that fifty-seven percent. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. So we'd have to think about that. Okay, I'd just be curious. We like, could certainly put sample questions out, perhaps. Yeah. How many questions are on the survey? Um, <coughs> it, I don't know off the top of my head, I'll be honest with you. Okay. I, Jess, I think it was in between like 15 and 17 at the 3-4 level. That's yeah. good, I just was going to say around 20, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'd be curious to see it if it's possible to see it. Um, and then just wonder, like, I know that there's probably a plan in place, and when you look at the data, you start, your reels start spinning to be like, okay, how can we address this? And I don't, I don't think it's a question for tonight, but just sort of in general, I really look forward to seeing how um, you and the rest of the admin team and the principals of the different buildings start to work on that sense of belonging and like the downward slope of the graph as kids age. And it just feels kind of sad. Like I can see that based on the national percentiles, it's, it's not as dire, but uh, it's pretty bad in the sixth through eighth, you know, middle school level. 
And so it just. Um, what did know. the one kid say yeah. to you yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Well, obviously, yeah. Wait, did you tell us that's that one kid said yeah. to yeah. you at yeah. the middle school yesterday? Well, of course they don't belong. I'm like six, I'm 12 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So part of my middle school um, experience yesterday, which was great, um, I just like to hang out with students, right? That's why we're here. Um, was just really. Um, naming for her specifically, it wasn't particularly important for her to feel like a sense of belonging. And for me, I was like, but I care, like, I'm concerned. Um, and so it was just really interesting to have a little bit more like qualitative data. And also I think doing the work of showing students that you can feel a sense of belonging, right? It almost felt like she wasn't, and again, I don't want to put words in this young person's mouth with my like adult brain filtering yes. it, um, but it almost felt like she has learned over time that school's not a place where you need to feel a sense of belonging or like you matter, so like why would I expect that from my school? So I think that has to do with a lot of the work that we have to do around reframing what belonging and feeling belong, a sense of belonging and value really it looks like at school and can look like at school. And, and you are able to compare this data to national data, so it's like some similar survey questions that you're using that you can then use to compare against na national Panorama data. Panorama it for us. Nice. Panorama. Yeah. I know. I it's know. Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing um, to be able to compare. But the, the fact that we're in the 30th percentile, it would be so interesting to know, like, what school, what middle schools across this nation are in the 90th percentile, and what are they doing? Right? You know? Yeah. Like, what, what can we learn from them? Anyway. Yeah, and that was part of our conversation yesterday with the students. But yeah, no, it is like um, over, I think it was over 2 million students across the nation have taken this survey. So um, it's just really exciting to be able to compare this data. Um, and of course, even if we're in the 90th percentile, but our sense of belonging is still 50%, like still work to do. Yeah. Thank you. Very quick, but important appreciation. I just want to pass on to you. Just I recently met with a parent, and they were appreciating the um, kind of connecting and programming you did around introducing RBS and UES students, or I guess MSMS students, and just kind of really bridging that experience for them. Like the parents really, I mean, the parent knew about it, and they knew quite a bit about it, and was were able to just communicate that they felt like it was. It was just intentional. It was me. It wasn't just like gestural, but they really felt like there was like real thought and time put into it. So I just wanted to pass that on to you. And then um, also, I had met up with another parent who was also saying that like sometimes the kids you know a little bit more than the parents, but also for the parents, there's a lot of not knowing and mystery about like heading into the middle school. And that this parent was talking about like, hey, wouldn't it be great if I made myself or we kind of did some more networking in terms between parents, you know of uh, Roxbury students who are moving from RBS to MSMS, just like pick up, you know, what is that like, and all the things. So it was just a parent, so like, I feel like, you know, we're kind of into this merger now, five years, and you know, now there's some like institutional knowledge that, you know, caregivers have and that they could share between each other and that, that would probably be really valuable. But, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so thank you very much though for the programming that's starting to happen here. Yeah, no, thank well you. received. We just uh, had our first planning meeting for the retreat, I think, this week, so. Great. Um, looking at the, the planning calendar, it says winter assessments, February 7th. Are we expecting to sort of see these, the data in this format, com comparing fall to winter somewhere in there? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Will it also include spring? Or I don't know if I that kind of along if there's room have, for it or we don't have the a lot of these assessments are new we didn't take them in the spring or we didn't give them in the spring just the stars yeah okay excellent Nick is yeah. up Nick is up yeah um, chronic absenteeism can, can I ask a question on this first just a quick one the 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 um, fifty seven percent of being as opposed to 78% of belonging. Is that, a, is that a big school, small school thing? No, you know, is Shannon, that like a standard? Shannon addressed that, that question. I, I um, missed it, I'm sorry. Yeah, she, she was chalking it up to that, those kids having a new teacher, a new principal, new staff in the school. They took it the first two weeks of school 
So oh, there's a okay, lot of newness okay. in, their, yeah. in their lives. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. So, oh, sorry. oh. Okay. Uh, I just wondered whether it was a standard thing throughout the state. That... So I get to talk about chronic absenteeism. Yep. Um, and I will give a very brief refresher on what that is. Chronic absenteeism is missing 10% or more of the school year. It doesn't matter if we're talking about excused absences or unexcused absences. We're looking at the amount of time a young person is in our building. All of these things are amazing that we just heard, and none of it happens if they're not in the building. And so I get to spend a lot of time with our students that uh, are maybe uh, not feeling that sense of belonging or struggling academically, um, and, and using that a little bit and not coming to school. Uh, and so when I talk about chronic absenteeism, at this point in the school year, this data is pulled from October 27th, so there were 40 school days so far, so it's missing four days of school is all we're talking about here, is missing four days of school. Um, so our numbers right now in our district, 23.5% of young people are chronically absent uh, as of October 27th, so that's 258 students. This time last year, as a district, we were at about 25%, so it's coming down a little bit. Um, a, a, an important indicator to look at uh, as well is uh, young people who may qualify for free or reduced lunch. Uh, that tends to be one of the higher rates of absenteeism that we see. Um, this is paralleled with most other districts uh, and across the country as well. That's sitting at 35%. So 35% of young people who may qualify for free or reduced lunch uh, are chronically absent. Uh, and students who uh, may have an IEP uh, are chronically absent at a 30% rate. Um, so just wanted to kind of give these numbers, put them in front of you, talk a little bit about what that means. Um, we're really talking about, again, a young person who's maybe missing four days, but chronic absenteeism, even early in the school year, is a primary indicator that uh, we need to address it quickly. If we're waiting till they're hitting 10, 20 days to respond to absenteeism, we've missed the mark already. Uh, one of the things I mention a lot is, over the course of a year, to miss 18 school days is to be chronically absent. There's about 18 school days in the month of October. So to be chronically absent in a school year is to miss an entire month of school. And that's a month without breaks or anything like that. So this is a really big factor when we look at the metrics of young people who are chronically absent and we look at academic performance. There's a, a, lot, there's a huge gap there when we're talking about academic performance for students that are not chronically absent versus students that, that are. We're looking at behavior data. Our students that are chronically absent are more likely to show up in our behavior data. Um, we're looking at belonging data. It's hard to have a sense of belonging when you're not in school. Um, so we, we feel like it's really important to center uh, this metric uh, as we look at how can we best uh, support our students and families. Um, in the report, there's also across the board for each of our schools, and I'll run through those just real quick. Um, at Roxbury Village School, 19% of students are chronically absent. It was 47% this time last year. That could be a swing here of four or five students, um, just based on the size. At UES, 16% of students are chronically absent. Last year, that was at 22%. Um, at Main Street Middle School, it's 21% right now. Last year, it was at 23%. Uh, and Montpelier High School is at 33%. Last year, about the same. The way that we look at attendance at the high school is different uh, because we track attendance by class period. And so what we're looking at at the high school is a little bit different. Um, than what we would see at the middle school or elementary school. When we take attendance at the middle school or elementary school, you're present or you're not, right? It's a one-time daily attendance. At the high school, we have five, six classes, and you can be absent three times out of six. So we're looking at lost instructional time, so there's more opportunity for us to take a look at um, what this, how the students are engaging in every individual class. So we tend to see higher rates here in our high school because of how we're looking at the data. A um, few quick trends, um, we, we have seen a, a, a slight decrease uh, and, and it's continuing to hold, which I'm, I'm really happy about. Uh, we also are seeing more absences this year marked as absent excused versus absent unexcused. So absent unexcused is going down in our district, absent excused is going up a little bit. Um, I think that... Uh, Part of that is, is about um, just health and wellness, and the other part of it is like families just communicating differently at the elementary school, for example. Um, folks are using uh, Parent Portal or Pickup Patrol, I think is what it's called. Is that right? 
pick up a job. Thank you. Um, so there's more vehicles for a family to communicate uh, why their student may be out. Um, so even with that, so even though we're seeing absent unexcused go down, it's still really concerning because we're talking about a mindset issue. We're talking about access to health care. We're talking about um, you know, coming out of a pandemic when a, a young person may be not feeling well. It's a really different conversation we have in, in 2023 than we had in you know, 2018 with what it means to go to school. And we really got to start thinking about that mindset to ensure that our students are coming to school while still at the same time really being mindful of, of what our nurses are telling us. So I would encourage folks to reach out to our school nurses, check the website for what is the guidance around being in school. Um, that lost instructional time is really having an impact on our students for sure. The last thing I'll note um, is supporting and working alongside our families who may be experiencing homelessness or um, who may be facing food insecurity. That seems to be on the rise as well. Um, and so we, we do certainly have um, uh, families that are in need of a lot of support uh, when it comes to having access to food, access to housing. Um, all of these pieces are having a, a, a really big impact on our students' ability to be present and ready for school. Um, so that's the snapshot of chronic absenteeism in this moment. Uh, if you would like, you can ask Mike more questions. I'm wondering um, what strategies you're using to alleviate that problem. Yeah, uh, it's a lot. And, and a big part of, of working with our families is meeting them where they're at and, and that being more than a tagline. Um, it's about being at their doorstep. It's about building a relationship with the family to understand what are the barriers that you're facing. Um, when I first started, Libby was very clear with me and said, you need to tell us where we suck. And I was like, all right. I literally said yeah. that. <laughs> um, and so being able to bring back and lift up the voices of our families um, who are, are maybe not connecting with the school in the same way as some other families who are maybe facing barriers that we aren't thinking about because they aren't necessarily the loudest voice in the room. Um, that's a huge strategy. Just from the start, we start with how are you and how can we support? We don't start with why are you not in school, right? Like that's a big shift. The other shift in the mentality and, and why we talk about chronic absenteeism, it's different than the traditional model of truancy. <coughs> truancy, which we still follow, it's written in law and we still have to move forward with truancy, but it's about criminalizing absenteeism essentially. And that's only talking about unexcused absences. What is excused versus what is unexcused for different families, for different people that take that call. As much as we try to standardize that, there's still some bias that creeps in there. And so we want to respond to any time a young person's not in school. Right? If they're out 20 days for a stomach ache, I'm still going to call and have a conversation and say, well, what's going on? Do you have access to health care? Is that something we can help you with? Um, is this maybe more anxiety based and the stomach ache is symptomatic of that? Um, so it, the biggest strategy is centering the voices of our families and understanding what's happening. <coughs> is that I, if I'm recalling correctly, we're seeing progress in the right direction, right? There is less of it, less chronic absenteeism than there was when you first started. But it's still feeling like this problem is a lot bigger than that wonderful, beautiful, hands-on, really deep work that you're doing. And I'm wondering if there are other things that we can be doing that, that uh, complement the deep work that are more broad based like it, are there broad education things like I'm, I'm thinking like somehow in the middle school in the high school they dropped cell phone usage by 57 percent through a policy I'm not saying we do a policy on chronic absenteeism but is there something that could be broad based education of our community to help with the understanding of the importance of being in school for parents who are maybe not quite at the level of needing and families not m maybe needing the same kind of hands-on in-depth relationship building that you're doing but still need that like under maybe some understanding I don't know yeah absolutely I think um, what I'm hearing you name too is, is also just giving information to the community around what it means to miss two days in a month of school and that has this impact um, the overall communication and how we um, reach out and, and connect with our families, whatever we're putting on the website, all of these pieces are factors. There's also 
an MTSS system around absenteeism too, which is like at the tier one level, like do we greet students by their name at the door? Mm -hmm. Do we look at belonging data? You know, what is it telling us and how are we developing strategies? A young person who has a strong sense of belonging tends to not be the person that has anxiety and doesn't want to come to school, right? So if we can boost that belonging, hopefully we can decrease that, those feelings of anxiety and not wanting to be in school. So I think there's systematic strategies that are being built in um, through the work of Jess uh, and the rest of the team to really understand that. And if we are making systematic changes, we really need to listen to our students and families first and foremost. Those closest to, to the issue are, are the ones who can solve that issue. And so when we're really listening to their voice and centering that, that gets embedded into the systems that these three folks up here are putting in play as well, which I think chips away at it from that systematic level. Okay. So I think you answered my question that the, the numbers on this, on this slide are inclusive of excused absences. Absolutely. Also. And so, it, um, and I forget what percentage of, of them are excused. Um, I so. don't have that percentage okay. um, off the top, and I can get that for you. It um, might be interesting to just see it broken down that way. Yeah. Just, um, you know, because there does feel like there's a difference for like a kid going on a college tour, or no, that's not excused. Right. Um, a doctor's visit versus, you know, a college tour or yes. a, a family vacation. That there's a difference there. Absolutely. It might be interesting to see. Yes, and I would add on to that. When we do start to look at that and start to say excused, and this isn't what you're saying necessarily, but why I don't always just separate the two, we have this historical knowledge and, and institutional knowledge of what it means to have an excused absence and an unexcused absence. Yeah. And if we put the E on it, it's okay. Right. But it's the same academic impact. It's the same behavioral impact. Um, and so when we do that, I also want to just be mindful not to elevate what those mean yeah. and assign meaning to ABE or ABU. Um, because one student's reason to miss school is really appropriate for that family maybe, because they need to work and earn yeah, a living wage. Totally. But it's ABU. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, do, I think we've asked this before, or I've asked it before, but you don't have any way to compare this to like national data or state data. Yeah, so there's no state data in Vermont on chronic absenteeism. We are, I think, the only state that doesn't publish uh, chronic absenteeism data as a state in the country. Um, there are 36 states in the country that have it as part of their uh, ESSA plan. Um, and so uh, Vermont as a state, it's not something that has been built into our federal uh, plan as an option of what we're accountable to, so it's not centered in our state. Um, but I can say uh, chronic absenteeism across the country, when we talk about the pandemic, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic has doubled. Um, and what we saw in the 22-23 data across the country is that it came down like one percentage. So we are not seeing the recovery uh, in absenteeism that we would have expected to see after the pandemic. Like it's sticking. And how do our percentages compare? Can you say? Yeah, it's kind of all over the map, uh, honestly. Um, so it's generally what we would see is 20s, 25, 30 uh, across the country. Uh, but it really depends on, you know, if we were looking at school systems with similar demographics as ours and things like that, right. which is hard to, to say nationally. Um, but yeah, I, I think our numbers can and should be lower for sure, uh, and we can do a much better job. Um, I also think strategies of working with like local pediatricians and things like that are kind of mm -hmm. on the list for me, for mm -hmm. sure, of like, do our pediatricians, for example, check in about how, their stu how students are engaging in school? Is that question even asked? Mm -hmm. um, that's a national um, thread that's, that's being woven in throughout uh, a lot of the work happening around absenteeism. And I think locally, uh, that's definitely something we could tackle as well. Okay. And you don't have time in your day to call all of these 258 families. Um, so how do you prioritize? Like well, I don't call every day um, to all these families, but what we should do, and if we've done our jobs well, uh, a great example is this summer, um, we had Vermont Emergency Eats working with us so we could actually be delivering meals to families. So we were taking 175 meals out every week, starting in the summer. And what we were doing in that time is also connecting with families and saying, how are you feeling about the school year? My name's Nick, what do you need for the school year? 
so that when I do respond on September 20th, they already know me. So these relationships, um, for many of our families, I will get a text before I can text them. Um, so a big part of it is relationships. Obviously with 300 plus young people that are gonna be chronically absent, I don't have that. Um, and so it is a part of leveraging who's in our building that does have those relationships. How are we working with our registrars and attendance clerks and how they communicate what's being elevated to me or what's being elevated to the SEL team. Um, I also get to go to all of our resiliency team meetings as well and communicate with those teams and give up attendance updates. Hey, is anybody checking on this student? I'm noticing attendance is starting to drop. Let me know if you want me in or you got it. Um, so it is a tiered approach in that way as well. And when do you sleep? <laughs> uh, usually about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, well, thank you no, very no. much. One other quick, I would love to see that graph that you talked, you were talking about a correlation between Jess's data and yep. your data with the belonging and the panorama. absentee reason. I'll pull it. I want to pull that from Panorama. <laughs> I'm loving Panorama. Panorama's great. Um, yeah. I, just real quick, um, I'm wondering if, I'm assuming transportation is probably one of those barriers, right? It's a financial yes. barrier, it's a physical barrier, and we don't, we seem to have higher absenteeism at the high school. Um, I'm wondering if we, if there is enough need at the high school that if we were actually to like bus high school students, like is there enough demand and need that that could actually help improve things? I don't know, and the last thing I know, but I have to say, I'm saying this as a parent of a former field hockey champion who doesn't play field hockey. You know, we find school buses for sports, right? The school buses are lined up to take kids to sports, and yet if we have 33% of our high school students who are chronically absent, and even if a portion of those could could be more able to access school if they had a bus, I have no idea if that's true. This is just coming up to me now as we're talking about this, but. I'm just wondering if that's one of the big factors at MHS is transportation, and if maybe there's something else we can do. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I wouldn't necessarily say a reason that MHS is, is, is high is the lack of transportation. Um, we nationally will see much higher rates at the high school level than we see. It, it's actually like, usually it's kindergarten and 12th grade are the highest, and then it kind of does this. Um, and I will say, uh, it's been proven nationally, having access to a bus does increase attendance. That's just the reality. And our students who leave early for sports, is that an excused or an unexcused? If they are leaving early for sports, um, the amount that that happens is so low, it's typically not hitting any kind of threshold. Um, it's excused because it's a school function. Okay. Um, and uh, typically it might be like a last period, so if it's at the high school, maybe they miss one block, uh, but we've got attendance throughout the whole day, so actually, they're quite a bit. Okay. I have one last question. Um, students who are deemed chronically absent, there's a minimum bar, right, that puts them in that category. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what percentage of those kids have a much higher mm -hmm. level of absenteeism and are there special um, interventions for yeah. those kids? So that, so what you're referring to is what I would refer to as students that miss 20% or more of school, which is severely chronically absent. Um, there is a chunk of students, certainly in that window, and, and really when we're looking at missing that much school, it's external intervention that has to happen. It's making sure they're connected to local uh, community organizations that are experts in the work that can dig in in ways that the schools cannot. And, and frankly, we're doing that at even 10%. Um, that's a tier three intervention that we're putting in that is about collaborating with external organizations. We'll have meetings where we host, you know, uh, Elevate Youth Services and Washington County Mental Health and Family Center and Capstone all at the table because it's gonna take all of that to really work with that family and provide, help them find the stability that, that's gonna help them get to school. You know, uh, Nick, the, the overall one and a half percent in the district doesn't seem like much, but the numbers at the elementary school are pretty great. I mean, really great. Um, both schools, especially RBS. Um, but does that translate to better habits and different different mindsets as people move through? Absolutely. Because I mean, if we if if there's a great deal of change essentially at the early grades, is that gonna translate to greater attendance throughout. 
100%, right? When you think about if a young person is coming to school consistently, if any of us are doing anything consistently, it's habit forming, right? And so when we talk about a young person coming to school with, with some kind of frequency, they are much more likely to uh, develop friendships with their peers, develop relationships with their teachers, and develop positive academic habits, right? Those are three of the, the best things we can do to improve chronic absenteeism is to build that in our students. Um, so when we see it at the younger ages and we're seeing that chronic absenteeism drop a little bit and students are engaging more, absolutely that's going to have an impact on their sense of belonging throughout their academic career. Yeah, I see this as a, as a lot of success, yeah. so thank you. Okay. Any more questions for that? One last slide. Um, I'm actually going to suggest to the board that we table the overview of the MTSS model based on the time and yes. that we come back to it at a different sure. time, simply so we can all stay awake. Um, I will just say also, if you look at the slideshow, we highlighted UES this time around with um, success stories of the MTSS model. So make sure you, those are from our interventionists, the, straight from the words of their, their mouths. So, um, take a second to read through those as well. Uh, before we get to Act 127, 127 update, which might be, let's do the Act 127 update and then talk about schedule. One thing I do, I think the executive session, we probably want to kick to another evening. Maybe. I don't think we're looking at very many short um, board meetings coming up in the near future, so. Well, I've, um, I want to kick it to another Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank, uh, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, awesome, awesome work. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, I want to. I want to have time for this discussion, and I, I think we're going to rush it. Either rush it, or it's just going to drag on because we're in, in a circle. Um, what we do is we have two extra ones. I don't think we're going to need all that for budget. What I'm thinking is maybe on the 29th we just do an executive session and just take a half hour by Zoom and do the evaluation. Wait, are you, so we at the last meeting, just to get everybody on the same page here with what, what I think you're saying, at the last meeting we scheduled two extra board meetings, yes. one on November 29th and one on December 13th. 13th. And now what I hear you saying is what for the November 29th? Well, I think I don't think we're going to need both of those for the budget. We might. I think we want to, might want to keep the 13th for the budget because we're getting the full budget presentation on the 6th, right? No, we're, you're giving us the direction on the 6th. So we're getting the budget presentation on the 29th? Twin. No, not the 29th. Oh, we're getting, oh, we're getting direction on the 6th, and then we're getting, when are we getting the, pre, the presentation on the 20th? So the way we had it set was the 29th of November, the board was going to discuss direction, which you, I think you're still going to need to do. Um, Agreed. And then the 6th would be the um, direction given the time yeah. to have the direction given. Unless you want to give a direction on the 29th, and then we can try to have something ready on the 6th. The 13th was going to be the first presentation of the budget. I mean, and the I 20th was what? And the 20th was for what? The second presentation of the budget. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So we're think we were So essentially you could think of November 29th and December 6th as like part one and part two of the same conversation. Yeah. I, I Which I do think we're going to need. Although we're going we, to don't have the, the rough budget choices that we had before. I, I think we can do the executive session one of those two nights. Okay. What are the, um, sorry, what were the two additional meetings that we scheduled at the last meeting? 29th and the 13th. November 29th and December 13th. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and we, Jim's point is we might not need both of those extra meetings cause it, anymore. Because I think Libby's Act 120 is we can we may be able to effectively level fund. Let's year. not get ahead of ourselves. I think you. But that, but how about this? It will it will be. I think the neighborhood we're talking about is level funding to minor cuts rather than a series of major cuts, which I think is a much less complicated discussion, at least for this year. Mm -hmm. Try to give the pressure. Sure. So. Um, I, as the board knows, I asked for clarity around which, how do we count our pupils from FY24. So school districts across the state were doing it two different ways. Um, 
and we were told by the agency to do it one way before last board meeting, and we've been told to do it a different way for this board meeting, which is good news. <laughs> um, so what they've told us to do for right now, what they've told the whole state to do for right now, is to take our fiscal year 24 um, number as if one, Act 127 was in effect for last for the budget we're currently in, for FY24. Um, and so by doing that, um, that, that increases the number of pupils we have. It increases everybody's number of pupils because there's more weights. And so um, that allows for more money to be spent in order, or before we reach the 10% capacity for increases across two years. Are you meaning to share that on Zoom? Those um, slides I can. No? Yeah. Did that make sense to people? I mean, so essentially we're able to build this coming year's budget against a different a, per people weight. A different per, I, I, I want to say, I, I'm just going to say it. Okay. A fictionalized yes. budget for this year that acts as if we have the same weighting system. So yes. that way we're comparing more apples to apples. Yes. And with the comparison of apples to apples, that budget presentation that Libby gave involving kind of what we're committed to and, you know, the, the $2 million gets, it gets us most close, much closer to 10% than it did before. <coughs> Perhaps, on, I think she's still playing with some numbers, but it's, it, it's within a small range of 10 it might be a little under, it might be a slight bit over, but it's not that like 15 to 16 percent range we were in before. Um, right. Does that, does that make sense? So that's the good news. The, the staffing numbers are coming, becoming more solid as we know more salaries. We're getting column movements for our teaching staff, so when they've taken classes they can move a column and get paid more money. Um, as well as we know that the health benefit increased to 16.5%, which was, is no different from the last time I presented. So those numbers are getting more solid, and unfortunately, it's not a $2 million figure anymore. It's more like $2.8 million. So um, with these new, new assumptions still, in order to stay below the 10% increase in the pupils, um, it looks as if we can spend about $2.4 million we can add about 2.4 million to our general budget. Okay, so last time I met with you, it was 800,000, but with this different way to count the pupils, it's about 2.4 million. Um, so that will that will not cover the the salaries and benefits, but we're much closer now. <laughs> we're much closer to that. Um, so at 2.4 million, that gets us to a per pupil increase between FY 24 and 25 as 9.99. 7%. Um, so it's as close as we can get to that number. Um, so it's more money we can spend for this year's budget. It still, it still means that we will have to do some, some, some cutting within our budget um, and probably within the FTE category in order to accomplish that. Um, however, it's a much easier way to, I can see, there's a, it's a much easier avenue to get there than it was before. Um, so some other things that we're thinking about is that this doesn't change the long-term five-year projection. That still remains, that, there is, that there's, there's going to be a cliff that people are starting to call it, um, which I'm not great, I'm not wonderful about that term, but there's a cliff in FY30. Um, and I'll give you an example. So Christina ran the numbers of if Act 127 was fully in effect last year for FY24 when we were doing our budget, um, in order to have the same tax rate that Roxbury and Montpelier citizens paid for FY24, our budget would need to be $2 million less, right? So if you think about it, I've been trying to figure out like how to explain the, the five-year piece, right? If you think about it starting from that $2 million hole and then we're gonna add another $2 million this year to that, that's going to keep increasing over time, even if we even if we add less in the next four years. So, 
Um, so there's still this five-year gap, and there's some other uncertainties that um, if the school board members who saw the webinar yesterday heard in the webinar, there's still uncertainty. So there's the 5% cap, the education fund's going to pay for the difference between what we need to run our school system and that 5% cap. Um, there's uncertainty of where that money's gonna, how the ed fund is going to continue to be solvent. Um, and the answer that was given yesterday by um, Brad James at the Agency of Education, if you heard it, was that's a legislative decision and he's not sure how they're going to do it yet. So that's still up in the air. Um, and then how this influences the dollar yield over time, which of course influences our overall tax rate, is also still in the air. Although everybody who's, who's understanding about this is, is, is pretty confident that dollar yield is going to decrease. But that is one factor the legislature can play with, or the tax commissioner can play with, in order to um, make the ad fund solve it, is my understanding. Um, so our actual enrollment, kids' rear ends and seats, has dropped about 40 students. So we're not talking about weighted students, we're talking actual kids, has dropped about 40 students. In one year? Yeah. Um, so that will, it, that will decrease our, our LTW ADM from what it was last year, from FY24 slightly. I don't know how much it was because it depends on the weights, right? Um, and so the, the question that still I'm really trying to grapple with is how do we forecast this five years from now so that the school board and the administration can thoughtfully plan what needs to happen in order to come in with a responsible budget um, for FY30, that this continues to not be a one-year problem or a two-year problem, but it's a five-year challenge that we have to face. Um, I do also want to say that um, there is a website now on our, or on our, there's a budget page on our website, sorry, um, that has any question that's been asked to us about uh, 127 answered and also facts about 127 on there so people can access that. Yeah, which is super helpful. And thank you to Anna and you for putting yeah. that together. I have a question. So, Jake. Um, do we know our long-term weighted ADM for FY25? Not yet. Are we using the same number from FY24? Like, uh, for, as an estimate? No, so that's a good question. So Christina and I were, were thinking, like, if we're down 40 actual kids, like, we just put an estimate in. So our, the long-term weighted average for 24, we know that was 1803. Uh -huh. And so we put in 1780. We just dropped it slightly. All right. Well, I noticed on here, or earlier presentation, we lost three English language learners this year, 53 to 50. And those count as like three students each, right. Right. or more than that. Right. So yeah, yeah. So it's so that that's it's hard to ask. You know, like we need the actual numbers. Christina's been working on it. Nicole Lee sent, who's at the agency of education, she sent a, a spreadsheet to figure it out. But we're it's complicated math, so we're still working on that. On the solvency thing, I could share some theories with you, but it's probably too late at night for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's the question that everybody in education right now is asking. It's how do we do that? We don't work well with, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Like that's not an answer that educators that work like. well with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nobody likes that. Yeah. <laughs> Emma. My hand, but you just know. You just oh, it was it was it was itchy. It was itchy. <laughs> it is about to go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I I I feel like there needs to be some sort of apology to the community, and I'll give it just from my personal perspective that I'm sorry that the, at the last meeting, for really factors that are kind of outside of anybody's control, except for the fact that we did decide to present numbers. Um, that there were numbers that were presented that were really startling and upsetting, um, like Montpelier taxes going up by 108%. Like these numbers being thrown around are so shocking and um, it starts to make people's heads spin around really dramatic you know, ways to come up with that difference. And I'm just sorry that we had to put everybody through that mental exercise when really two weeks later now we're saying, okay, well, maybe we could actually um, level fund or add a little bit to the budget. 
Well, this well, isn't a level funded budget. This is not a level funded budget. Yeah. Two, adding two point four million dollars is not a level funded budget. Yeah. And, and and I also want to kind of yeah. You know, but it's not a hundred and eight percent increase. It's not hundred and eight percent. It's not a one point two million dollar budget cut. No. So it's quite different in a pretty dramatically more positive way. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And and I know there was there was shock value, and I think you know the shock value came from an honest accounting of what we thought yeah. the numbers were. The numbers are fifteen. I, I mean, I think there is an overall grand narrative of we are going to have five years that are going to be very different from the five years we've had, and there there are going to likely be some choices that we have not had to confront as a board for a while. And you know, I think we've got more time to make those choices and make those intelligently and, and make those thoughtfully and make those with the type of input we want. But this is not like get out of jail information. I mean we are we are still in, in a a budget situation. I think you know part of the the difficulty with the budget situation is how much uncertainty there is and, and there are just a lot of, of looming questions. Um, but yeah, no. I, I, the 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 shock from from last week was was unfortunate, but it was, it was a very honest accounting, and I think you know we value transparency, and we were being transparent with what we had. Um, you know, this is much better news, but it's not. It, it it buys us time to I think have a more thoughtful conversation of, and also a little more time to figure out what this five year um, decrease in funding from the state is going to mean for us. Mia. Yeah. I wanted to offer a slight reframe to what Emma just said, not that I disagree with how unfortunate it was, but also that I think there's a, um, a silver lining to this of the amount of community engagement we saw be to, because people care so much. And I just want to keep encouraging people that even as the information changes and even as we maybe even like um, mess up along the way, it's sort of like that kindergarten teacher we're learning together and let's all go let's all figure this out together i think is a is another way for us to to look at this and i just want to keep encouraging people to keep coming to these meetings and keep trying to wrap their heads around this the same way we are um and that as the information changes stick with us so that we can figure this out together yeah. Yeah, I will say that we, we were using numbers that we were told to use. Exactly. It was. Um, from the state. And then the other piece is that, you know, there, there are some, and Bill was on the webinar yesterday up in Maple Run who said, I'm not sharing numbers. I don't feel like that's right. I, we, Bill and I actually debated that <laughs> around should we share numbers, should we not share numbers. Um, and I think that when we're talking about the position that Montpelier Roxbury will be in for the next five years, to not share numbers is to not be transparent, even if they're assumptions. And and I think that that is the way to go with our community. It's certainly so what our community has asked for over and over and over. We can't have a conversation if we don't know what we're up against. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm also kind of like, ooh, just one thing, just adding on that, like, I mean, I am so glad all of you came out tonight because, you know, I think we need to have the conversation that got started about what what is this decrease going to look like? I'm not sure if we had these numbers in the first place. It would have been different. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think I think Roxbury is now going to be very engaged in this conversation and be willing to work for the next year to really, you know, think thoughtfully about what the future of RBS is going to look like in a budget constrained world. And I think that's what it has to have to happen. And I'm not sure that would have happened if, yeah. You know, if we didn't get kind of like a starker look at what some of the more draconian um, dances were. So, you know, I think you're right, Mia. The silver lining is a lot of people are engaged and, and hopefully will continue to be engaged for the next year because, you know, this is, this is a problem that if we all work together thoughtfully and as two communities and really put our, our brains together, we're going to come out with the best solutions. If, if we have, if we get into the situation where we thought we were, we're like, you know, holy crap, we've got six weeks to make major, major decisions, that's when stupid things happen. I think, right. like, Libby, your whole tenure here has about has been about crisis upon crisis upon <laughs> crisis. <laughs> and your instinct has been to, sh to be as transparent as you can possibly be, as quickly as you can possibly be. And, you know, I really appreciate that. And that's where you were coming from here. I mean, I think it was... It, it was a hard thing. It was an emotional thing. I think that I personally referred to 
some decisions is irresponsible, and I feel sorry for that because I don't think that any decisions were irresponsible. I think it's an emotional thing, um, but I think it, that you know that instinct to be transparent and put up a red flag and say, "Whoa, we've got a major problem," is is is, is better than um, other pathways. I think it's safer for you. I think that you know in my line of work, when there's a concern, you call in the every, everybody. You call everybody. And then, you know, everybody gets together and tries to make the best choice that they can, and you don't make a choice yourself without bringing in as many resources as you possibly can. Um, and so I appreciate that this is the way it's gone, as uncomfortable and difficult as it is and as it will probably continue to be. Yeah. <laughs> the intake of breath. Yeah. <laughs> That's your call. Um, I, I would like to say that um, you know the the state um, has uh, not done well the past thirty years with education finance and explaining how it works. <laughs> um, it's really problematic. You cannot have local control without local comprehension, and local comprehension is a, at a very dangerously bad. <laughs> failing percentage um, so um, you know in this case like major education funding reform and the guidance has not been good not been clear everyone has been lost um, so I, I mean I think that's super unfortunate and I'm sorry for that um, I think that um, as we navigate the next few years um, we can do a good job explaining how all the taxpayers including those who get income-based credits are going to be impacted I'm willing to help with that, um, and um, I want to correct misconceptions before they really get out there, because I've already heard quite a few. So I want to make sure we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah excellent. Um, Those are the things that we can put on our FAQ, yeah. too, so we can for sure and talk about that. Um, when can we expect to see like a revised version of this? Presentation. This presentation is not on your budget website. The one from last week. I w well, we Which, can't revise it because it's a public record, right? So we won't I mean, be changing a it. new one that reflects the new math. That you're so there, uh, you have yeah. The slides you just four slides she has I was talking four slides about. That so that will go. This. It's like yeah. So we'll be able to compare sort of like apples to apples yes. from what we were told two yes. weeks ago to yeah. what is on the slides now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I thought you meant like reply. Revise that actual slideshow. No. No. I think that was our last item on the agenda. Oh, it was our last item on the agenda. I didn't know if that was our off. last I'm last question. <laughs> 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 we got a second. I heard it. Okay. Did, did we miss anything? Okay. Yeah, we, we postponed. Yeah, we, we did postpone things. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything squeezing. Go, we're we're adjourned. So go ahead. Ask. Oh, is it? Everyone in favor of yes. adjourning? Yes. I okay. Great.